Good evening all and welcome. Tonight's video has been graciously sponsored by Skillshare. This amazing platform offers a huge variety of online classes on literally anything you can think of, taught by the experts themselves. And with many of us now being stuck at home a hell of a lot more, it might be time to brush up on your existing skills or learn something entirely new. Be productive, make the most of your time like me. I've been learning Tai Chi from the Aquarius Academy, and I think I'm really starting to get somewhere now. If anyone else is interested, I highly recommend them. There are so many classes you can do, so go nuts and learn everything you possibly can. The first 1000 people who click the link in my description will get a free trial of Skillshare Premium, so hurry up because this won't last longer than a few days. But for now, it's time to get comfortable and let the darkness take control. I lived in a share house with three other guys at the time. However, they were all at their various jobs and I worked night shift at a nearby gas station. I was in bed after a shift fast asleep and I started awake, not really knowing why. There was a period of about 15 to 20 seconds after I began to wake up of silence, followed by a knock at the door. At this point, having just woken up, I was still trying to get my bearings. However, I realized that I must have woken up from someone knocking at the door. Another 15 to 20 seconds pass in silence, and I start to think maybe it was just a door to door salesperson or charity collections or whatever and figure they must have left. So I start to relax a little at this point. Then the entire front of the house starts to shake. And I can hear what sounds like someone hitting the front wall with a sledgehammer. At this point, I can't really process what's going on. My first thoughts are since we lived across from a train station, it must be because of the activity there, maybe a freight train grumbling past. I don't know why I thought that, but my mind said it was the most logical thing. Then the banging stops momentarily, but resumes five seconds later. By this point, less than two minutes had passed since I woke up. However, it felt like my brain had only just started working. I realized now that at the very least something was happening in the front of the house that I didn't really like. The bangs were very loud and the house was pretty old and warped, almost entirely made of wood. At this point, I started to panic. I could feel the shaking frame starting to give under the blows. So I did the only thing which I could think of and started yelling and screaming unsteadily at the front of my house. From memory, I think I frantically yelled something like, What are you doing? Almost as suddenly as it started, the banging stopped, and I heard some footsteps running away. For some reason, it gave me the confidence I needed to look around for a weapon to grab before I went out to confront whoever it was. I remember thinking the handle felt a little weird. And when I opened the front door, by the time I got outside, they were gone, almost as if they had never been there at all. I should mention at this point, I was getting about two hours sleep a day before my graveyard shifts. So I was a little sleep deprived and I knew I wasn't really thinking clearly. So I started to question if anything had happened at all. When I went outside, I looked for any signs of damage to verify for sure whether this really had happened or not. That's when I saw the front door and realized why the handle felt odd. The flimsy wooden door had been struck next to the handle repeatedly and had started to splinter. If they had kicked the center of the door, I'm sure their foot would have gone right through. But they were kicking next to the handle, closer to the frame where it was slightly stronger. One or two more kicks and they'd have been inside. The police came later and I filed the report, but nothing was stolen. And there was nothing stolen from the unlocked garage beneath the bedrooms. They were either too stupid to check the downstairs first, or weren't looking to steal anything. Which really is the more concerning part. When I was about five to seven years old, I lived in a house with my brother and my dad where we always saw spooky things happening. And we thought it was haunted. One of the things my brother and I remembers from this house was a scary shadow. I was probably five. 
that my brother was two years older than me. But I know this was not our imagination because we both remembered the same thing. We were walking downstairs while my dad was in the shower, and my brother and I for a split second saw a large shadow behind the bar of a man who looked to be wearing a trench coat and a fedora. It disappeared right after we saw it. Another time our cousin had came over to the house for a sleepover, and he was staying in the hallway upstairs. He was right next to the steps. He was a few years older than my brother and I, he was perhaps 11 or 12 when this happened. But when he was trying to sleep, he heard creaks and ghostly noises. He also claimed to have seen a shadowy figure moving around downstairs. The figure was wearing a trench coat or fedora. In our time at the house, many people have sworn to heard noises from under the porch. My brother and I would never go into the attic alone, because we would hear things coming from the ceiling above my brother's room. I haven't been to the house in a long time now, and I'm wondering if we really were haunted by some spirits. This is the story of why I stopped taking the late bus from Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia's capital city, to Kajang. It happened a few decades ago, long before they built a metro system that connects Kuala Lumpur and Kajang and smaller places beyond it. At the time, I was involved in a centralized training for the spot I competed in. I was in the state team, which was training at the center in Kuala Lumpur. The training sometimes went on a little longer than usual, which meant I would have to take the late bus to get home. The bus from Puduraya, now called Pudu Central Station at 10pm, and arrived at Kajang Town just before 11. I would then take a different bus home. This bus left Kajang Town at 11, and this meant I would get home just before midnight. Thankfully, the team only trained three times a week. On this fateful night, I had to take the 10 o'clock bus. That night, it rained, which meant that most people stayed home and didn't go out. It also meant that the working people tried their best to leave for home as early as possible, so that they could avoid the traffic jams that would happen if the rainwater flooded the road anywhere along it. When I got on the bus, there were only about a dozen other people on the bus, and we were all wet. We sat in our respective seats and tried not to shiver when the bus started moving, and the cold night air came through the open window. This was the days before we had air conditioned buses playing this route. Some resorted to closing the windows, but this would only make the bus stuffy. So we braved the wind and the occasional drops of water. I had my martial arts uniform under my jacket anyway, so the cold didn't bother me that much. The bus ride was normal and quiet. The bus stopped at the housing estates along the route. And by the time the bus reached Cheras, which was about seven kilometers from Purayada, all the other passengers had alighted, leaving me alone on the bus with the driver. At one stop, the bus stopped, and the last passenger alighted. Then a young woman hopped on. I was not looking in her direction when she came on, because I was staring at the traffic jam on the other side of the road. I was thankful that our side was a lot clearer. When I turned from the window, I saw the young woman walk past me. She was gorgeous, dressed in an old style Malay dress called the Baju Karam. And what struck me later was she was completely dry. When she walked past me, I caught a whiff of her sweet smelling flower perfume. She sat in the last few rows of seats. The bus continued on its trajectory. I found myself turning in my seat to look at this woman, and I could not help myself. She was by far the most beautiful young woman I had ever seen. I just couldn't keep my eyes off her. A few minutes later, she seemed to notice that she was being watched. She looked up, directly at me, and smiled. This smile made me feel embarrassed, but made her look even more radiant. As the bus approached my destination, I fought the urge to approach her to introduce myself. 
as it started to draw in to the Keijang terminal. I resolved that I might as well introduce myself when we left the bus. I was hoping that I could get to know her. If it meant I had to walk her home, so be it. The bus pulled in. I got up and made my way to the exit. I thought I would get off the bus, then wait for her to get off as well and say hello. My plan was genius. When I got off, I saw that no one was exiting after me. I went to the door, up the steps to look around, but she wasn't there. Where did she go? I asked the bus driver who was busy packing up. Who? He replied. The girl who sat behind me? He looked at me. You were the only one on the bus, my friend. I thanked him, got off the bus, then surveyed the almost deserted bus terminal. She was gone. I sighed, then made my way to the bus station that went to my area. It belonged to a different bus company. The image of her face never left my mind. I intentionally took the 10 o'clock bus the next few times I had training at the capital, just to be able to see her again, to no avail. It was a month or so later, when I found myself waiting for the bus to Kuala Lumpur at the same bus station. I sat on a bench to get some refreshments, and one of the company's bus drivers sat on the bench beside me. Going to Kuala Lumpur? He asked. I confirmed, and we started chatting, killing time. Then I mentioned that I saw a young woman. She was very beautiful. Had long shoulders. <laughs> It was at this point, the man interrupted me. Very beautiful, long black shoulder length hair, wearing a light green kurang dress. <gasps> you know her? I knew her, he corrected me. Then he told me that she was a regular on the 10 o'clock bus when he used to drive it years earlier. He noticed her because of her beauty also. One night, she took the 10 o'clock bus when the bus was empty safe for her. She rang the bell at a housing estate a couple of stops before caging town. He stopped the bus and she got off. That was the last time anyone saw her alive. He said they found her body in a ditch across the road from where he left her. Investigations revealed that she was the victim of a hit and run. The driver was never caught. However, he added that about two years after the incident, a car was found in the same ditch one morning, the driver dead. The local people who found the driver reported saying that the man's face was contorted in a look of utter terror. I still took the 10 o'clock bus for the duration of my training program with the hope I would see the woman again, but sadly, I never did. One night, I was sleeping. My husband was on night shift. My three kids were in their rooms fast asleep, and I was dreaming although I can't remember what I was dreaming about. Suddenly, all the noises in my dream muted, and I heard an urgent but calm voice overhead coming from the sky saying, Wake up, Amy. Wake up now. Someone is in the house. The kids. Go get the kids. Immediately, I awoke. I sat there in a daze, like, what a weird dream. And I went back to lie down, but I just had a feeling in my gut. I got out of bed and walked around the house. All was quiet. I went to my son's room. He was sleeping and safe. I then went to my daughter's room. I opened the door and saw a black shadow standing by her bed. I flicked the light switch on and there standing by my daughter was a man I'd never seen before. I was so scared, I jumped on her bed, covered her body with mine and just started screaming at him. The man hurried and jumped out the window, as our rooms are on the first floor. Her entire screen was bent and pulled out. He must have pulled the screen out and then opened the window, which wasn't locked. Luckily, my daughter woke up as I was screaming. She did not see the man. I called the police and my husband. Turns out the guy was a neighbor's brother. He'd been staying with him for the summer. He drank with my husband and neighbor and knew that my husband worked night shift and that we'd be home alone. When the cops interrogated him, he swore he had a drug habit and only broke in to steal items or money for drugs. He had no intention of hurting my daughter. 
I don't believe him. If that voice in my dream didn't wake me up, who knows what would have happened. The second time it happened, I was once again asleep. My husband was home sleeping next to me, and I was dreaming when again it all went quiet, and the same calm but urgent voice said, Wake up, Amy. Go to Nova. Nova is in trouble. Nova is my middle daughter. She was five at the time, and I woke up and flew into her room. Before I even switched the light on, I could hear her wheezing. She was having an asthma attack. I switched the light on, and my poor baby's face was blue. Tears were streaming down her face. I ran her to the bathroom, got her inhaler, and I screamed for my husband to dial 911. She took her inhaler, but it was too much. Luckily, the ambulance arrived and got her to hospital. She was in there for three days. I can't explain why this warning happened during two occasions where my children were in danger. Maybe it's a form of mother's intuition. Maybe it's a dead relative. Who knows? Has anyone ever had anything like this happen to them? My family and I moved into a new house, which is a two by four house. It used to have an attic, but has since been sealed off. After a few months of living in this house, sometimes I'm just watching TV and hear scratching from the roof. I just play it off as being a bird. They're common where we live. And three weeks after the scratching, it got worse and more frequent. It's almost as if it were trying to scratch its way out of the roof. The attic entrance is above the outside of my sister's room. And one day my sister tells my dad the seal was open. My dad gets confused because it was supposed to be sealed off. So my dad goes to close it and realizes that it's really hard to open and close. So whatever opened it was strong. That's when I start to get skeptical. The same night I go to get a snack from the fridge. I open it to find out that they're gone. I think my sister must have eaten it. In the morning, my parents are going on about a missing cake. The cake was supposed to be for my niece's birthday. They ask if I had anything to do with it. And I say no, along with all my other siblings. I was getting very suspicious about the attic. So I built up the courage to go check it out. Please note, I am also probably the most paranoid person on this earth. So I was scared for my life, but the curiosity got the best of me. I get the ladder, a torch and a knife just in case. I open the hatch, I shine my torch inside to see nothing. But as I search, I see the cake, empty snack pellets, dirty clothes, and a short, dark silhouette. It just freezes on the spot, and I immediately bolt and scream for my parents and tell them everything. They tell me to go stay in my room, and when they go and check it out, it was gone. I'm still in shock from that moment, and get nightmares from it. We have since moved, and no longer live anywhere near there. I was on my way back home from the city centre and I had a sandwich with me. I have to take this bus to get home, and it's about 16 stops until I arrive. Usually, it's only me, and sometimes one other person that gets off at my stop. I got on the bus at the back door, this was roughly 9pm, and the minute I sat down, this drunk guy comes to me and asks if I speak Hungarian. There are a lot of beggars in this area, and I'm not surprised, and I say, no, even though I can. He then starts speaking to me in English and asks if I can give him money or food. I haven't got any Hungarian currency on me, I say. This is a lie because I just wanted to eat my damn sandwich. The guy then proceeds to signal me to give him a piece of my sandwich and almost breaks a piece off. So I say, sorry, dude, no offense. I want to eat my food. At first, he seems pretty chill about it, but then it gets interesting. He sits back on his seat three rows behind. Now notice, he's not alone. He's with another two equally drunk gentlemen. The bus now closes its doors and starts. As I'm eating my sandwich, I hear these guys talking crap about me in Hungarian, assuming I don't understand it. 
Man, this twat won't give me a piece of his sandwich. Man, I could bash his head in with a glass, I'm so angry. I hear them agreeing on getting down at my stop so they can beat me up. I never had to deal with a situation like this. So I started to think and came to the conclusion that my best option was to get down at my stop and run home. Not the usual route, like hell, because I can easily outrun three 30 year old drunk guys. Meanwhile, I'm forced to focus on what to do and I don't even touch my sandwich. This got them even angrier. He isn't even finishing the sandwich. I bet he gets home and throws it in the garbage. Then one of them said, he murdered someone in his dreams. The other one said, he dreamt the same thing too, and that this isn't a coincidence. I'm there like, surely they aren't that barbaric. But I was wrong. I hear the three discussing my height, weight, buffness, and agree that they can easily take me on three on one. At this point, I'm sweating and thinking about other options because my stop is coming up and we're heading into the suburbs. The bus is starting to get empty. Then I realized I could pretend that I got off somewhere and hope they do. So I decided to do that. At the last relatively busy bus stop before my stop, I stood up and went to the front door where four other people stood waiting to get off. The bus stops and I start to go towards the door, but stop when they can't see me. Surprise, surprise, they got off. The guy starts walking to my door calmly because there were other people at the stop. But when he got to my door, luckily it closed. I checked if anyone got off with me at my stop though. I think this could have gone much, much worse. So I was lucky to get the best case scenario. Who knows what those guys would have been capable of. And for all of those of you who were asking, I did finish the rest of the sandwich at home. I live in Australia. My house is on a hill and has an upstairs and a downstairs. I have the downstairs part, which has a kitchen, a fridge, dining room, bedroom with a TV lounge and bed. One important fact is that I have a side yard above my sloped backyard, which can be accessed through the garage into the downstairs through a storage hallway. So it all starts around yesterday as I was trying to get to sleep. I swear I could have heard footsteps pacing around the side yard. I brushed it off as I owned two dogs and it was probably just them. I woke up however, to find one shoe in the yard it was an old Nike runner shoe covered in dirt. I have two dogs. So I put two and two together and thought they'd found a shoe in the backyard and dropped it on the side of the yard, which is nothing out of the ordinary. Fast forward to tonight. It's about midnight. I'm watching something on YouTube and I decide to call it a night, but I was hungry. So I got up to raid my fridge. But as I opened the door to my room, to the kitchen, there was an absolutely horrifying skinny wrinkly bearded man staring at me in the middle of the room. He looked like a crackhead that ran out of ice. And we have a crystal meth epidemic over here. He was wearing a four beer singlet with blue short pants. I promptly crapped myself hard and yelled out and tripped backwards onto my ass. And as soon as I laid an eye on him, he ran off through the storage hallway and disappeared into the night. At first, I honestly didn't know what just happened. I thought it was some kind of ghost. So I get up and shut the door behind me and run upstairs to my parents. They go down and say the place was trashed and the door to the side yard was wide open, even though I had locked it. That's when it hit me. I had stumbled across an intruder. But when I left the downstairs, nothing other than a chair was knocked over or moved. But when I came back down, a lot of the stuff on the counter was moved or thrown off, as well as chairs and a vacuum cleaner, meaning that he came back into the house and trashed the place in the span of a minute and a half. Nothing of value in my bedroom was taken luckily, as I had a laptop and phone in there. The door was still closed, but from my kitchen drawer, one of the large kitchen knives were missing. 
We of course called the police and they went looking for him. They say his description matches with a burglar who's on the run in the area. I think that since I closed the door behind me, when I went upstairs, he thought I was still in the room and therefore didn't go in. But that's just my theory. But it's almost surreal knowing how close I was to potentially losing my life with my own kitchen knife in my own house. Either way, let's not meet again. When I was in my youth, about 13 years old, my friends and I thought it would be a good idea to try and summon a ghost. So we set up a table with candles and such and started our seance. In the beginning, there was nothing. So we decided to leave the table and go out instead. We were at the attic of one of my friend's houses and the door was not lockable. Weirdly enough, we couldn't open the door, but also all the windows were shut at the time and the whole room felt charged with electricity. After a few minutes, the door opened by itself, and since then weird things happened to us. I went to my Imam instantly and told him about it. He said a prayer for me and the problem was solved. He also said to me that we invited a lesser demon into our circle and took my promise to never do such a stupid thing again. Since that day, I started to study occultism theoretically and witnessed a few exorcisms in which I was really invited by my Imam. So I can clearly say that the paranormal exists. I urge everyone to never try summoning anything because it's not possible to get what you want. You're more likely to summon something far more sinister, which will not rest until it has taken you. This happened to me at around 8pm about a year ago. As soon as I get on the bus, I notice this guy sitting in the front. Seems and looks like a normal dude, like he's just finished a long day's work. When I find a seat by the window near the back, that same guy moves to a seat in front of me, which was also giving him a clear view of me. I was wondering why, but I gave him the benefit of the doubt. However, there was something about this entire situation that just didn't seem right. So I begin watching him from the reflection on the window. I see that he's staring at me. And when I look in his direction, he looks away. He then proceeds to look out the window rummaging through his bags, drink some Gatorade, apply some Vaseline onto his hand, and basically trying to come off as inconspicuous as possible. Yet, Yet there was something about the way his feet were positioned, how he was constantly doing something and obviously him looking at me that didn't settle quite right with me. The stop I was planning on getting off at is in a relatively quiet part of the city and I'd have to walk a bit to get to my destination. With businesses already closed, there'd be no one around besides cars zooming by. So at the very last minute, I decide to get off in a much more busy area, like I predicted. He catches me from the corner of his eye requesting the driver stop and starts getting ready to leave. I'm slow to alight and so is he, and I look at him, and so is he. Since the stop is directly in front of a train station, I prayed that he was just going to walk there and that that would be the end of this. Of course, no. There's a good distance between us on the street, but he puts his bags down and pretends to be rummaging through them, but still has his eye on me. I stay where I am, because another bus at that same stop was going to come soon that would take me closer to my destination and watch him from the corner of my eye. A few minutes pass and he walks away. I notice him getting on a streetcar and block down, and I can finally breathe. I see my bus coming, and I am just so relieved. I look back in his direction one last time, and notice that he got off the streetcar and is just standing there. I hurry into the bus and pray that he doesn't run to get in. He doesn't, and I get to my destination safely, even though the bus driver completely skips over my stop for some reason, but whatever. I just want to let you guys know that you should seriously be aware of your surroundings and always question. 
normal looking people can be suspicious as hell. Had I not first walked into the bus and noticed him change seats, I don't know what would have happened to me that night. I lived in a pretty average middle upper class neighborhood. Two sides of my house were flanked by an old overgrown Christmas tree farm. And we were at the end of a quiet street. For some reason I had taken to leaving my window open at night for fresh air. And it was a good thing this sort of short lived habit hit when it did. At 1am I hear this car door slam shut. And I think it's weird. We're the only house accessible here. Two guys got out and they crossed our lawn to the side of the house that faces the farm and stood near a window to my dining room. Another sedan pulls up and two more guys get out. One has a chain and rope. At this point, I try to wake my alcoholic parents who assure me I was just having a bad dream. I go downstairs and watch them out the window for a bit while they're chatting and smoking. One goes to the farm and comes back. I tried to wake my parents up, but now they're up and my mum's got the window open. My dad's loading his gun and has the police on the line. Something tips the dude off. Honestly, it was probably me shouting at my parents and they leave right before the cops pull up. The cop tells us he'd up patrol and left. Makes me wonder why I slept with the windows open. I let me hear them all show up. My family moved into a new house roughly a year and a half ago, which they had to renovate. I moved in with them over the summer. The house itself isn't too bad. They're your typical creepy noises here and there, but nothing like the apartment I grew up in. That was haunted for sure. However, something off about the house is the attic. My brother and his girlfriend live up there, and they themselves have said it feels off. My brother's girlfriend has woken up with scratches on her body. And my brother himself prefers not to be up there too much because of this uneasy feeling. My dad and I were up there the other day to fix my brother's toilet. And we both kept feeling off and uneasy, as if someone were watching us. And I kept catching stuff out of the corner of my eye. This is the only part of the house where we feel this way. I stay in the basement and I don't even feel that way down there. My family wants me to bless the attic. I'm not a religious person, however, I do consider myself spiritual, and I'm also an ordained minister. Does anyone have any tips on how to go about this? Any prayers or objects I should have in my hand when I'm blessing the place? Any assistance would be greatly appreciated. I was about 16 at the time. I rode the public bus to and from school. This particular day, I had done some special effects makeup before the end of my classes. So I had fake blood running down my face. And I couldn't be bothered to take it off before leaving school. Now I knew I was boarding my bus, people would stare and ask questions. So I wasn't surprised when this man who looked to be in his mid 30s started asking about the makeup. The conversation was normal at first, just the usual. Oh, wow. Did you do that yourself? Kind of stuff. I answered the question as I normally would and expected the conversation to be done and over with. Boy, was I wrong. This man, who he mentioned his name was Joe, started steering the conversation into strange territory, asking me if I had a boyfriend, to which I lied and said I did. He then proceeded to ask if my boyfriend liked the makeup and if I was on my way to see him now. I lied and said he did, and that I was in fact going to go see him, trying to get Joe to believe someone was expecting me. The conversation died down for a bit until he says, You know, you remind me a lot of my sister, he said with a grin. I just smiled in response, not really knowing what to say. After not hearing anything from Joe, he continued, My sister was kind of a bitch. She was always lying about me to our parents. I had fantasies of breaking her jaw. Now, at this point, I was terrified. My bus stop was still another 20 minutes away. 
and I just wanted to be out of this situation. Seeing that what he said made me uncomfortable, he switched subjects, telling me about where he worked and what he does there. I just nodded along with what he was saying, remaining silent the entire time. Closer to my bus stop, he says, don't you want to come to my house? I have a freezer full of pizza and ice cream. Maybe we can hang out for a while. To which I politely decline, saying my boyfriend was expecting me. Finally, I get off my bus stop and quickly get off the bus, speed walking all the way home, all the while calling a friend to inform them of what happened. Things were fine for a bit after that. I switched my bus route so I wouldn't run into him again. But one afternoon, I had to go to a store that was on my old route. I was nervous about getting on that bus again, but was happy when I didn't see Joe. I did my shopping, and just as I was leaving the store, I saw Joe standing out by the door staring at me. The second I was out the doors, he walked over to me, grin on his face and wrapped his arms around me. I pulled him away from me, telling him I was very busy and had to go. He then asks, well, what are you doing? I have time, I can tag along. I was very persistent, saying that I really couldn't and that I had to go and walked away heading into a neighboring store that I knew would be busy. Sure enough, Joe followed. I ignored him as I made my way down a heavily populated makeup aisle, keeping my attention on some cheap lipsticks in the hopes he'd get the hint and leave me alone. I was wrong. Joe reached over my shoulder, grabbing a red lipstick as he leaned in close and whispered, the color would look gorgeous on you. I can't wait to see you wearing it. He then put the lipstick in my basket and walked away leaving the store. I remained in the store for about 20 minutes after his departure, afraid to leave and make the walk home. After I mustered up the courage, I put the lipstick back, put away the basket and called a friend to stay on the line with me until I made it home. Now I don't know if he followed me or not, but I can say that after that day, the motion detector porch light started coming on at night an awful lot, and I started hearing knocks at my bedroom window. Thankfully, I moved shortly after, and haven't seen Joe since. This happened in 2007, when I was 19. I was attending college in what I thought was a very safe southern town, with a population of about 30,000 people. I was lucky enough to have a modest place to myself, because my family owned property in a suburban area that they no longer used. The house was very small, but sat in the middle of a two acre fenced lot with a lot of pine trees and shrubbery. So Saturday night, some friends picked me up and we went to a few parties, hung out at their house, nothing major. They dropped me back off at my house around 1am. I had two dogs that usually sleep in my room. But this night they were being restless. So I put them in the living room and closed my bedroom door so they couldn't keep bothering me. And I instantly fell asleep. A few hours later, I awoke and saw a man climbing in my bedroom window through the shades. My bed was pushed completely up against the wall by the window. So by the time I saw him, he already had a knife to my throat and a hand over my mouth. I don't think I intentionally left the window unlocked, but I'm a five foot 11 girl and was almost out of reach from the ground. It was also incredibly narrow, maybe one to one and a half feet high, three feet across. It never even crossed my mind that someone would or could break in through that window. My first feeling was absolute rage. I remember that more than anything, I could instantly tell I had no idea who he was. His cheeks were really hollowed out and he was very thin. He was also older than me, maybe in his thirties. He said, if you don't scream, I won't kill you. His voice was so calm. I remember later thinking that his tone was so normal. We could have been discussing the weather. He took his hand off my mouth and he was bleeding from his fingernails. I told him I had money I could give him. 
he could have my car, and I just started rambling on about any possessions I think I had. He said, that's not what I'm here for. To cut the conversation short, this lunatic held me down for five minutes or more, just talking to me. I asked him things like how he knew I was there, and he said it was a lucky guess. By then my dog started freaking out in the living room, and he seemed to get a little unnerved. He became more serious and started groping me, and told me to lay down. I had bunched myself into the corner you see. When he let go of me just for a second, I was able to push him off and dive headfirst out my window. When I fell, I landed on a metal lawn chair that he dug up from the yard. I was only sleeping in my underwear when this happened, so in addition to all the scrapes on my mouth, my whole body got pretty bruised and scuffed from the fall. I immediately got up and ran as quickly as I could to my neighbor's house, who happened to be a state trooper. Time has never been slower than it was when I was standing outside banging on his front door. When he answered the door, I quickly told him what happened, and he grabbed a bulletproof vest, a weapon, and ran towards my house. His wife called 911 and gave me some clothes and helped me clean up a little. Running had taken a layer of skin off the bottom of my feet, and I had left bloody footprints on their carpet. They never found out who it was. My friend that dropped me off said they saw a man with red hair walking down my road. It was too dark in my room for me to know what the color of his hair was exactly. I could tell he was left-handed by the way he held the knife. The police were beyond unhelpful. They only told me that he had to have been watching me for a while to know that I lived there alone and which room was mine. A few years later, a man was arrested for a previously unsolved charge in 2005 of a girl a few miles from my place. He was never charged with anything relating to her end in 2005, but his semen was found at the crime scene and he lived in her building. He also had red hair and was left handed. Moral of the story, lock your windows. Let me start by saying I didn't believe in ghosts before this. All of this took place in 2014, in a small town in New Jersey. New Year's Eve going into 2014, and I was at my old friend Jay's house. He would always tell me about his house being haunted, and told me that the majority of the activity was confined to the attic. We decided to go up there and do a voice recording. I couldn't believe my ears when we put it on the speaker. We actually caught a voice. But much to my disappointment, my dumbass deleted it by accident. The rest of the recordings I do have though. So we told our other friend John about this, and he wanted to experience it for himself. Let me give you the layout of the attic. When you walk up the stairs, there's a little alcove to the left, and a little alcove to the right. And when you get to the top of the stairs, there's a window on the back side of the attic. And when you turn around, there's a small room where the maid stayed back in the 1800s. Other than that, it was just a regular attic. Things scattered all over the place, holiday decorations, Jay and his siblings old toys, and the like. So John, Jay and myself went into the attic and put our phone voice memos on record. I put mine on in the main part of the attic, and John put his in the maid's room. We started asking the basic questions. What's your name? Did you live here? What year is it? After about 15 minutes, we decided to call it quits. I shut off my recorder, and John went to get his, and I heard chimes, and asked Jay if he had a clock in his attic, and he said no. I immediately wrote it off as my imagination. When John went to grab his recorder, he started goofing around. He walked into the maid room and in a sarcastic voice said, hello, and then asked, is anyone here? 
then grabbed his recorder and shut it off. When we put it on the speaker, though, after John said hello, we heard a loud and clear shh. And then when he asked if anyone were there, we all heard a deep grumbling voice say, "Yes." Needless to say, we were all scared, but at the same time, we were all terrified. However, we wanted more. It was like a drug. There wasn't much to do around in the area, and it was an adrenaline rush hearing that voice. The following week, I was with this girl I had a major crush on, called Celia. She didn't believe in the supernatural at all. We showed her the recordings, and she insisted it was bull. She then started demanding to go into the attic. Jay didn't want to have any part of it, so he came up with us for a few minutes before we even turned on the recorders and said he wanted to go back downstairs and that he didn't feel safe up there. Celia also insisted on the lights being off when we did this. She said it would be more creepy. She didn't believe in it anyway, so we all thought it was a dumb request. But I had a crush on her, so her wish was my command. The lights went off, and she stood up next to me near the back window of the attic, and John stood in the maid's room. We started asking questions, and she had a sarcastic tone in her voice, much like John did at first as well. She then whispered to me, "Does Jay have a clock up here?" I was taken aback for a second. I told her I heard the same thing last week. Almost immediately after I answered, we heard John from the maid room say, "Did you hear that?" As I was about to answer, thinking he was talking about the chimes, we all heard a child's whimper. Celia freaked out and started screaming to get her the hell out of there, and that she wanted to leave. John stopped his recorder. And I escorted Celia into Jay's room and came back into the attic to grab my own. As she sat and collected herself, John and I agreed with her permission to listen to the recordings at that moment. But there was no child's voice on the recording. She started getting agitated because she knew she heard the voice. She wanted to go back up, and we all agreed. John also told me we didn't say goodbye to the spirits either before we left, and that that wasn't good. So we went back upstairs, did another recording, and said goodbye. That time we didn't catch anything, and the next morning I woke up to five missed calls from Jay. I called him back immediately, and he answered, which wasn't like him. It was early in the morning, and Jay never woke up until eleven. He told me I needed to go to his house as quickly as possible. You need to understand, Jay basically lived alone in the house. His brother usually had to fly out to California for work, and his father, who was retired, did a lot of fishing in Maryland. So at this point, Jay had been in the house by himself for about five days. Jay was always terrified of going into his attic for as long as I can remember. He told me that the spirit pushed him down the stairs when he was ten, and that the only way he went into the attic was with at least one other person. He was also a terrible liar. So when he told me this, I thought he was playing a trick on me, but I soon realized that it wasn't. He told me that around three a.m. after we left, he kept hearing noises in his attic, like things were moving around. He wanted to go check it out, but didn't want to go alone. He asked me to go first. As I walked up the stairs, I started laughing, because everything in the attic was in perfect order. Now, there was a rocking chair and a wooden chair facing out the right alcove window, and another chair facing the back side window. The right side alcove was completely closed off, and there was a desk and some wood blocking it. I turned to Jay and said, "Funny dude, I thought you didn't like it up here." But when I looked in his eyes, I can tell it wasn't him that moved them. He was stricken with horror and frozen still. He tried to get the words out of his mouth. 
I asked him if it were okay if I did another recording. I put my phone down and began. I started to ask if it could throw things around or move something or hit me. Nothing. I opted to provoke it. I walked over to the rocking chair and had this feeling of dread in the pit of my stomach. I turned to Jay and said, I don't like this dude. He chuckled, but we both listened to the voice recording back, and there was an old man's voice saying, Get up. We didn't hear it at the same time, so we kept provoking and moving things in that little spot, and that's when on the recorder we heard a little girl say, Why are they doing that? When Jay and I heard that, we were scared. This wasn't like the first voice. This wasn't like the child we heard in the attic at this point. We realized something. We didn't know what, but we both had that same feeling. We both needed answers. I called John and told him to go to Jay's at around eight. I had class and was in barber college at the time, and I would meet him there. Then I headed to Jay's after class and met John and Jay there. We went up to the attic and started recording. We asked the regular questions again. We went back to listen and we heard the chimes that Celia and I had heard. I was pretty astounded to hear that, but we didn't catch any voices, so relaxed that next day. And I sent the recording to my friend Frank. He showed it to my friend Pat, who then called me, telling me to never go into the attic again. He told me that those chimes were the notes of the Devil's Triad. I tried to look it up but couldn't find anything, but I trusted Pat. He told me those chimes were to show that you worshipped the Devil. This piqued my interest, and after I got a call from Pat, I told Jay that I had something to tell him, and asked to go over to his house, and he told me he had something to show me. I got to his place, and he was on the porch smoking a cig. I pulled out one and had it with him, and noticed he was holding a book. He told me he found it, and handed it to me. It was a Bible. He told me that he was renovating his basement space and it was behind a wall. Inside it read, Presented to Roseanne Edwards by her cabinet, April 9th, 1862. He told me to turn to one of the pages. I forgot which page, but on that page was a dark handprint. He said it looked like dried blood. There's no way to verify that. I still don't know to this day. I told him what Pat told me, and he was taken aback. I told him we should go to the country clerk and find out more about the house. Before I left, I asked Jay to put the Bible in the attic to see if we could stir up any activity. I called Celia and went straight to the country clerk together. She asked to come to Jay's later that night as she hadn't been back because she was afraid. We went through the documents at the clerk's and we found something interesting. We saw previous owners up until 1910s, but after that, we saw that it was owned by a company starting in the 1850s. The house was where they allowed workers to live, but there were no documents about who lived in the house. So all in all, nothing significant. We went back to Jay's that night and met John there. Jay said the house felt heavy all day. We all knew what that meant. The energy shifted the moment we walked into the house. We all felt scared, and none of us wanted to even approach the attic. Although we heard movement up there from downstairs, we didn't want to go up. I do regret that. I'm sure we would have captured something good, but we were all afraid. We left the Bible in the attic on Jay's request, and we all discussed getting a priest there to get the house blessed but Jay didn't want to. I told my younger brother about it, and he didn't believe me. I went to Jay's house, where we all heard the noise, and then he refused to go into the attic after hearing it. Just as we were leaving, we stepped outside, and my brother and I heard a baby crying. It was at least midnight in the middle of winter, and my brother and I looked at each other confused. Why is there a baby crying? My brother said. It was getting louder. But then Jay interjected. 
What baby? We kept hearing it escalate in loudness. It got so loud I felt like I should cover my ear. Don't you hear that? I said. Jay didn't have a clue what we were talking about. That's when it just stopped. Jay had a weird look on his face, and his eyes got wide and he said, Bro, look at your car. There was a small child's handprint all over the car. I was afraid to get in, and for the entire ride home my anxiety was peaking. I thought that if I would look in the rearview mirror, I'd see something, but nothing happened. When I finally got home, I was messaging Celia about what happened, and she told me that a cat had hissed at her. That cat had never done anything like that before, and when she walked into her house, the cat just hissed. As I was trying to calm her down, the bookshelf I have in my room came tumbling down, and a small metal box I owned went across my room and hit the wall and broke in half. Jay told me it felt like his house went through a small earthquake, and after our separate experiences, Jay agreed to have the Bible taken out. Activity significantly calmed down, and that was it. When I tell people this story, I always wish that I had a better ending. But something tells me that this isn't over. Three years ago, I moved to Florida, found a job in a shop, and people in the shop were telling ghost stories. I never brought mine up. When I tell people the story, I feel like they'll think I'm crazy, even though everything you've just heard actually happened. I don't think people believe it, so I don't tell them until I know them relatively well. Anyway, they were telling stories, and one person pointed to me and said, this guy had a story, and I thought he was pointing to someone else, so I looked behind me, and he laughed and said, No, you. That shadow let me know. You've got something attached to you. He then proceeded to tell me the story of Jay's house. I felt like I wanted to cry when he told me. Ever since then, I've started doing investigations on my own. My sister, four years younger than me, who must have been around 14 at the time, and myself, used to be huge anime nerds, and I mean huge. We had gone to a couple of conventions before, but always accompanied by my mum, who I think was more than a little embarrassed by the amount of crappy Japanese that was spoken. So when the next convention rolled in, and I asked to be the responsible adult to accompany my sister, she was more than happy to let us go as long as we came back early and kept in touch. We were thrilled. That con was happening in our city's WTC, which happened to be opposite to where we lived, at least a two hour trip on public transport. We packed our stuff, including our cosplay, and took a bus to the subway. Halfway along the trip, we had to change transport once again and take the subway bus, a bus that had defined stations like the subway, because it was the only way to get there. So we hopped off the subway and made our way to the new station. Now the spot where the subway and sub bus met is a round plaza that has always been very busy. The subway entrance is in the middle and the sub bus goes around it. So you had to cross it in order to get to the station itself. We had just walked out of the subway when suddenly this teenage looking guy passes next to us and asks us the time. He seemed a bit shifty and my spider senses immediately tingled off. Since a few weeks back, I was almost robbed with this same tactic. But before I could say anything, my sister pulled out her cell phone, told him the time and he walked off. It's okay, girl. He just probably wanted to know the time. He didn't necessarily wanted to know if you had valuables to try and steal them, I assured myself as we made our way in between the people. But when I casually turned around, the guy was following us. He was probably taking the same bus, I thought, but my mind was already in alert mode. I didn't want to scare my sister, who was thankfully oblivious to what was going on. So I began to make a really long trip round the plaza to see maybe if I was just paranoid and he'd take a different route. But he stayed behind us and seemed to be getting closer. 
The sub bus usually has cops on the entrance, and I figured that if we managed to get there quickly, he wouldn't be able to do anything to us. But I feared that he would try to rip the bag off my sister to keep her cell phone. So as casually as I could, I told her to put her bag in front of her and run to the sub bus and call the cop when I told her to. She looked at me like I was crazy. She still hadn't realized that we were being followed, but complied. And as we approached the stairs to the sub bus, I saw the guy quicken his pace and told her to go. She ran up the stairs and the guy tried to catch up to us. And I turned around and confronted him blocking the way to my sister. I am in no way an intimidating person. I'm five foot two, extremely slim. I'm wearing my geekiest clothes, cat sweatshirt with ears included. So I'm sure I wouldn't even have scared a care bear. But I guess the guy didn't expect me to turn and face him with my meanest face, which I must say resembles SpongeBob angry, or that my sister would be out of his reach so quickly. He looked at me, turned around and disappeared between the mass of people. Nobody even noticed that he had been pursuing us, nor my act of bravery. Thinking in retrospect, I'm lucky he wasn't violent or armed. He could have taken me down in two seconds. I felt proud of myself and sister and was grateful. The cops didn't even bother looking for the guy when we told him because there are so many little thefts in the area and he technically hadn't done anything wrong yet. We managed to arrive to our convention safely and had a blast. So to the kid that tried to rob my sister, back off or I'll scare you with my Star Wars shirt and poor vision. This happened while I was an undergraduate student. It was summer and I recently moved out of the dorms. I was excited for the freedom, but most excited to have our family dogs come live with me. He was my best friend and the worst part of college was being away from him. I was the first to move into the house out of my friends. However, they would always come over to pregame before they wanted to head to the bars. One night after drinking shenanigans, we stumbled our way back home. Me being fairly drunk, headed off to bed with my dog trotting behind me. I left my friends to sleep on the couch. In my room, I had my bed against the wall with the door. The foot of the bed faced the doors. The light switch was next to the door above the foot of my bed. My dog's bed was on the opposite room. He had a good view of the whole room and he wasn't allowed on my bed, but he really loved his dog bed and preferred to sleep there. I don't know what time this happened, but the light in my room turned on. I sleepishly roll over and see this big mannish figure standing over me. The next thing I hear was my dog going crazy, barking, growling, and just being incredibly fierce. The figure sprinted out of my room with my dog on his tail. That was the last I ever saw of him. My friend who was sleeping in the living room was like, a man just ran out of here. We had no idea who he was. We didn't call the cops till next morning. We should have called them that night, but we were young, dumb and buzzed, and I was underage. We did notice the next morning my iPod and wallet were missing. A friend found my ID on the street a week later, but we can't figure out why he'd come to my room and turn the light on. He passed my friends to get to my room and the light would be seen from where they were sleeping. The one thing I do know is that my dog stopped whatever worse bad things could have happened. That evening, when we returned to bed, he jumped on my bed and laid next to me. I knew he would never let anything happen to me. So to the strange, mysterious man in my house, let's not meet. I don't think my dog will let you escape again. Around two years ago, my mum told me to go to the attic to put away some decorations from Halloween. I made a few rounds when I noticed the cat at the corner of my eye. It had no body or head, just white ears, legs and a tail. When I told my mum about it, she went into the attic to try and find the cat, but found nothing. The other time I believe I encountered it was when I was walking to my parents room. 
I started hearing a cat screaming at the door of the attic. It sounded like a young kitten, but none of the cats screamed like what I heard. I opened the door, and the screaming stopped. When I told my mum about the screaming, she went up to find my oldest cat under the guest bed and nowhere near the door. I'm not sure if it's the spirit of my neighbor's cat that died a few years ago, because of how the patterning was, as it looked familiar, or if it's something else entirely. I go to college in the city, but I live a few miles outside of it, and therefore catch a bus to and from college every day. After finishing at college today, I caught my bus home. At the bus station, a family of five people got on. There was a girl, her mother and father, I'm assuming, and another older couple, who I took to be one of the parents. During the bus journey, for whatever reason, the girl kept turning around and looking at me, not smiling or saying anything, just looking at me. I didn't pay attention, and I just carried on looking through my phone. During the journey, they all seemed to be talking and laughing amongst each other. Now my bus goes through some very rural areas. Think country roads with the occasional house between a couple of small towns. At some point, the father just gets up without saying anything and walks downstairs to get off the bus at a stop in the middle of nowhere. The only thing in sight is a small gravel path that may be led to a house or farm of some kind. After this, the rest of them followed and went downstairs at the next stop. But only the older couple got off and started walking backwards towards where the father would have gotten off. Again, nothing around but a few houses, although in the opposite direction to the pair walked, but the girl and her mother did not get off. Now me being me was a little curious about this, so I kept looking out of the window to see what was going on, as the bus stopped for a few minutes here, but it started up again without the girl and her mother getting off. For the rest of my journey, I kept looking out the window at each end just to satisfy my curiosity, but they still didn't get off the bus. My stop is at the end of the line for the bus, and the upper level was all empty at this point. I walked downstairs at the end of my journey to get off, and they were nowhere to be seen. Without any shadow of a doubt, they didn't get off the bus at any of the stops, and weren't on the bus at the end of the journey. I was sat in the back of the bus on the left hand window seat, and you can see the front of the bus and doors from my seat. There were no other doors to the bus, so they couldn't have left the bus on another side or anything. I didn't turn my attention or anything, as for the most of the journey I had my earphones in, and was just looking out the window for the most part. If anyone has any explanations, please share. I've been really weirded out by this. A few years back, sometime in 2015, it was a regular morning and me and my family were at home. My family is very small. The only ones being me, my sister and my mum. My mum at the time was cooking me and my sister pancakes for breakfast around 11am, when suddenly we hear the doorbell. Might I mention, me and my sister are both disabled. We're both in wheelchairs due to being born with a disability that doesn't allow us to walk or anything of the sort, so we really are quite dependent on our mother for protection. Anyway, we get a ring at the doorbell, but we ignore it since we aren't expecting anyone and we don't answer the door to solicitors. A few seconds after that, the doorbell rings again and the three of us don't really think much of it, but we thought it was a bit weird. So a few minutes pass and the doorbell is still going. Now we're a little bit scared. And when we suddenly started hearing rustling in the windows outside, my mum decided to open it. When she did, there was an Asian girl in her late teens attempting to pull the frame off our window. She had a blue Walmart bag filled with God knows what, but it looked heavy. The girl immediately stops what she's doing, and my mum yells, What do you think you're doing? She backs away from the window. We had noticed a strange black truck parked right in front of our house, and we could see two other people waiting inside it. We live in a small neighbourhood, 
and are unfamiliar with this drug. So the girl backs away and says, Um, is Michelle here? My mum says, There's no Michelle here. Get away from our house. My mum was swearing a lot because she was scared. It was just us at home, and there was no one to protect us. I was really scared. My sister was crying while we ate our pancakes, and the girl immediately ran off as my mum got louder, and she just kept on asking for Michelle. The girl ran to the mysterious black truck, and it peeled off. My mum began freaking out and called the police. She gave them her description, but they never came to investigate. That day, my mum made an appointment to get us ADT home security. That night we all slept in her bed, because the room that the Asian girl was taking the window off was mine and my sister's room. My mum stayed up all night, walking around the house with her axe. No one tried getting in after that. And the next day, we got our home security with cameras and all that. Since then, no one ever tried getting in again. After talking to our neighbours about this, we learned that these mysterious intruders were returning. The same people robbed our neighbours. They weren't home at the time of the robbery, but they caught it on their cameras. They stole a few things, then left. Thank goodness we were safe though. So dear Asian girl asking for Michelle, let's never meet again. I go to school, and it's about an hour away on the bus. So I take the same bus every single day to get to school. Well today, I was on my way to school and we stopped at one bus stop that's kind of in the middle of nowhere in between my city and another city, which isn't even that far, about a 10 minute drive. A man is at the bus stop. He's got a bike. So he puts it on the front of the bus where there's a little bike holder and the man gets on. I'm sitting near the back of the bus and I notice him get on. And when I see that he has scars and scratches all over his face and bruises too. Parts of his face were covered in bandages, but otherwise he looked like your typical dude of five foot seven and wearing a hat and sunglasses, a white shirt and shorts. So when he gets on the bus, he seems to be rummaging through his bag for bus fare. I don't think much of this, but for some reason I have this strange feeling to keep my eye on him. I notice as he's walking towards the back of the bus that he is placing his hands in his pocket and staring at me very sharply, like a sort of smirk on his face. As he's walking past, I then notice he smells me, like deeply inhales my hair as he's walking past me. At this point, I completely get creeps. The man sits directly behind me. I'm not a big person, I'm female at approximately 5 foot 5 and in my early 20s, I'm roughly 130 pounds. And right now, it's almost summer. I'm wearing a nice crop down shirt and some light pants. My neck is fully exposed. I then notice he is just leaning forwards enough for me to see that he is staring directly at me. He had his hands in his pocket and was clearly holding something that he wanted no one to see in his hand. This makes me think back a few years to a man who was released from a prison slash rehab for cutting off someone's head on the Greyhound, and then trying to eat them. I'm sure you've heard of it, if not, look it up. With this thought, I moved quickly to the front of the bus, just as it was coming up to the next stop. I sat with the driver and started talking, and that man got off the bus at the next stop. Passing me again by the driver, he leans in and smells me, and grabs his bag and leaves. He was only on the bus for a stop or two. Couldn't he have just used his bike? I'm glad I didn't end up with my ear in some dude's pocket. I work in a haunted salon, and I've had so many experiences here. The salon is an 114 year old shotgun house, with super high ceilings and pocket doors. It's located in an industrial area in the south. I think the house was relocated because it's super out of place. They bought the house back in the 90s for $20,000, dollars, 
with the intention of bulldozing it and expanding their family company next door. However, the city wouldn't let them because it's the oldest house in the town. It's been vacant the whole time they owned it, except for a brief period when her cousin lived in it. It didn't have any power or plumbing. So the cousin ran a hose and extension cord from next door. They had to gut the entire place during renovation. The inside was rotting and falling apart. It's beautiful. Now they preserved the pocket doors and kept the same layout. The natural light is amazing. I love working here. It's just me and D that work in the house. She does facial and lashes and I do hair. So on with the good stuff. When I first started D told me the batteries from the thermostat kept going missing. We have cameras all over the salon and outside. She would watch the cameras and nothing would show up. One day pretty recently, we had someone working in the attic. She came down and said, you know, there's a bunch of batteries up here, right? Another time, and this is my favorite story. D and I were working on a Saturday. She poured a glass of wine for her client to replace the cork. I remember watching her do this because she flipped the bottle upside down to make sure it was secure. And I thought it was funny. She put the wine back in the fridge and did the service. After she was finished, she left for the day. I left to run an errand. And when I got back from the salon, I came to find wine all over the floor. I look in the fridge and the wine doesn't have a cork in it. The cork is on the top of the fridge. I texted her something along the lines of you forgot to put the cork back in you dumb ho. And she responded, you watched me cork the wine and laughed at me. I told her to watch the cameras. So she did. The cameras showed me walking out the door and then they go offline. A few days later, D was alone doing facials. She shuts the door when she does facials and massages and mid facial. She heard someone walking up and down the hallway. She thought it was me because I wear boots to work and it sounded like someone in boots. Then it sounded like someone slammed against her door. So she walked out and there was no one there. She watched the cameras and there's nothing, no one in the hall. I hear knocking, walking and even faint talking sometimes. I don't feel super scared. I get a little freaked out when I'm in here at night by myself. But for the most part, I don't feel threatened. When I first started, I posted a bunch of pictures on the space on my Instagram. One of my friends stopped me one day and said, I don't know if you're aware, but there's a presence in each photo you posted. I didn't think much of what she said because I didn't see the presence she was pointing out. It's weird when other people bring it up with no context. D had a client in her mid sixties, pull her aside after her service and said, baby, you got spirits in here. They're not evil, but you might want to open up a Bible and let them find their way. Last night, D closed up the salon. We're all super vigilant about turning lights off because this house would burst into flames if there was a spark. She turned everything off and the doors lock automatically. But we always check because it's in a kind of sketchy part of town. She comes in this morning and every single light is on and the front door is wide open. Nothing was moved. We both have cash laying around and none of it was missing. It was weird. This happened on Wednesday night when I had just finished my shift at work. It was after 10 p.m. I had been drinking the night before in my wine and video game night and was still feeling the backlash in my stomach. I couldn't eat all day and now I had a deep hunger. So I decided to grab a meal from McDonald's since I wanted to have time to eat my food because it was a pleasant night. I walked up to the bus stop at the other end of the retail park where I worked. I reached the stop and noticed this older woman already sitting there, which kind of irked me since I liked this stop due to the fact it was normally empty and I could be alone. I guess that wasn't happening tonight. So I just sit down at the other end of the bench and continue eating. 
After a few minutes, I look up to see that the bus was approaching and accidentally lock eyes with the woman. She was staring intently, and my natural instinct was just to give her a quick smile and look away. But that seemed to make her think that it was okay to come and approach me and sit down next to me, pulling my headphones so they sat around my neck. Wow, rude. Shaken, I just stared at her until she grinned and spoke. Long night, eh? Working hard? Uh, yeah. Where do you work? I tell her a lie, and she starts asking me all these questions. Do I like it? Have I worked there long? And I do the usual tactic of short but polite answers. I look again to check for the bus, and suddenly feel her cold fingers on the inside of my bare forearm, my hoodie sleeves rolled up due to the nice weather. Wow. Your skin is so soft, she exclaimed while running her fingers up and down. Yeah, my skin's pretty smooth, but that doesn't mean you should touch it. I really don't like being touched. I kind of just stare at her in disbelief for a few seconds until she starts speaking excitedly. Yeah, really smooth. Are your legs smooth? Your back? Let me touch your neck and your face. Luckily, at that point I saw my bus approaching, and without saying a word to her, I flagged it down and got on. She didn't follow me, but the weird thing is she looked totally unremarkable, so I wasn't wary of her at all. But you can bet, I didn't go back to that stop for the next few nights. I'd like to keep my skin, thank you very much. I'm a female. Back when I was 18, my mum had been doing work in the garden, so she was exhausted and went to bed early. It was winter, so it got dark early. I knew I would be the only one awake for the next few hours, until her partner got in from work at 4am. I went about my usual nightly routine, rolled a joint and went out back to smoke it, as I did every night, and wasn't allowed to smoke in the house. The house had two floors, and my bedroom was on the top floor. After I had my smoke, I went back upstairs and continued watching whatever. About an hour later, I decided I would have one more joint then head to bed. I finished rolling and got myself ready to head out into the cold. But just before I headed downstairs, something on my phone distracted me, and I sat back down on the bed, concentrating on that. When a minute or two passed, I heard a loud bang from downstairs. I thought to myself, it's just my mum's partner coming home. Then seconds later, I realised I didn't hear the front gate open, didn't hear the taxi pull up outside, and didn't hear the front door open. My cat is on the bed next to me, so it wasn't him and my mum is asleep next door. So what could that bang be? I grabbed my taser and stuck it in my dressing gown pocket and go into my mum's room. Normally, she's such a light sleeper, but because she was exhausted from gardening, she slept through the noise. I wake her and tell her what I heard. She gets herself ready, grabs a metal pole and we head downstairs. I insisted on going first because my mum is like five foot six and 130 pounds, has a mess, and is holding a flimsy metal pole. I figured my taser would be a little better should we encounter anyone. Looking around, everything seemed fine. However, the last room we checked is the bathroom, which is on the ground floor, to find that the window that sits just above the bath is wide open, and are two one litre bottles of Tresemme shampoo and conditioner, which were on the windowsill, had been knocked to the bath. Of course, we're confused. How could this happen? It couldn't have been the wind. Now we're scared. It's 2.30am at this point, and my mum calls her partner to tell him someone has just tried to break through the window and to please come home. Oh, it's probably just a fox or something. Go to bed, you're being paranoid. 
That's his response. So we're like, well, you're no help. So they call the non-emergency police number to try and report it. Five minutes later, four police cars and dogs all turn up. They look around, then come to the door and ask the obvious questions after doing a walk around the house and area. They come back again and ask, do we usually keep our plastic garden chairs under the bathroom window? We do not. The police advise us that a dodgy gang have been going around the area, trying doors and windows to breaking and steal whatever they can. They must have taken the garden chairs to stand on top of them to get in. The police also advised that a house a few streets over had just been broken into and everything was taken and the house destroyed on the inside. I don't think they were ever caught. The thing that freaks me out the most, had I not gotten distracted by my phone before going out to the back to smoke, I would have been outside sitting on the same chairs in the pitch dark where the intruders would have come around and seen me and who'd have known what would have happened if that would have occurred. So to whoever was trying to break into my house, let's not. This happened to me about two years ago when I was 18. I'm female and was in my second week of college. Our school had off campus buildings where classes were often held. So small buses packed with students and professors going back and forth was common. The ride to these buildings were about an hour long. The buses were set up not like a school bus with the seats in pairs but with the seats going around the interior of the bus facing inwards. Anyway, I was sitting on the bus ready to head back to the main campus from my class. A man in his mid thirties wearing a suit entered the bus shortly after me and asked where I was going. I told him and he nodded and sat down next to me since, since it was only one of a few seats that were left. Since the trip was an hour long, pretty much everyone fell asleep. And it was normal because of the buses set up that people fell asleep and often woke up to people accidentally leaning on them. I fell asleep and woke up 40 minutes into the ride and noticed the man who sat down next to me was holding my hand. He was sleeping too. And I laughed to myself thinking that in his sleep, he accidentally held onto me. To avoid making him embarrassed or feeling awkward, I slithered my hand out of his as carefully as possible not to wake him. But as I did, his grip on me tightened and actually started to hurt. He was still sleeping and we were about 15 to 20 minutes away from our destination. So me being a chicken and scared out my mind, decided to put up with it until we got back to school. When we got back to campus, it was drizzling a bit. So I zoomed off the bus and whipped out my umbrella. But the man from the bus caught up to me and asked if he could walk under my umbrella with me. I thought this could no way be a coincidence, as a bunch of other people had umbrellas too, that he could have asked as well. But me being naive felt bad because he was wearing a suit and chalked up what happened previously to a misunderstanding. We walked under my umbrella and literally the first thing he asked was my age. I told him and he began to tell me he was getting his masters in some kind of math field that sounded complicated and I didn't remember what it was in. He then asked me for my number, but I politely declined and told him that I didn't give that away to strangers. Get this. He then tells me, I don't want your number to call or chat with you. I just want a friendship. That's all friendship. Big note from me. If you don't want my number for chatting with me, then what's the point? I was super weirded out. And by this time we approached a large bridge. A few really skinny stray dogs were on it. And the guy then pulls me into our hug with him and starts shrieking. I shove him and he apologizes and said he's scared of dogs. At this point, I'm even more terrified and just really want him gone. But as we're about to part ways, he tells me that his phone isn't working and has an emergency he needs to make. Me being very stupid, hands him mine, and he proceeds to call himself. His phone starts ringing in his pocket, and he looks at me with a chilling grin and says, 
Hey, now I got your number. I ended up filing a police report, and the super understanding officer helped me big time and banned him from taking the buses, as well as placed a no contact order between us. I thought maybe I was overreacting during this process. But after the detective read me the other guy's statement, I knew I did the right thing. He confirmed my story and said everything I claimed was true. He also said something along the lines of, Yes, I was aware that I was holding her while we were sleeping. I had no idea she didn't want me to do that, since she never said anything. While I was sleeping, dude, how would I? He went on to say, In my country, it's normal to marry younger girls, so I didn't think there was a problem. Buddy? Just no. Maybe he was just confused about customs or something, but I feel better talking about this and hoping I don't offend anyone. Thank you, creep. Let's never meet again. Everything begins when I was in my early years of high school. My sister, quite a few years older than me, moved out of our family home and into her first apartment. My mum was seeing someone new for the first time in a decade after her divorce with my father. My soon-to-be stepfather's children would soon have a room in our house, which was my sister's previously. It was the summer, and I, a young teenager, often spent my late, late nights on the couch downstairs, video chatting with friends on my laptop. On one particular night, it was about 2am, and my friends and I had just disconnected out our video call, when I heard a peculiar noise at my feet. The sound most closely resembled nails scratching at the pillows near my feet. I was immediately filled with dread, and my legs began to grow colder. My laptop was on my chest, cutting off all view of my lower body. In fear of what? or who I might see if I looked over or around my screen. I called my mother from upstairs. I was facing the stairs, and when she came halfway down the stairs out of bed, I asked her, what's sitting by my feet? She angrily replied, obviously, since I had woken her, nothing, what's the problem? I felt better, but not enough to stay downstairs. I went upstairs and climbed into bed for the night. I always sleep with the TV on and my door open, and fell asleep just fine, but was awoken abruptly in the middle of the night. It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia was playing. It took me a moment to realize what was happening, but I soon grasped what the gang was doing. They were digging up a grave to steal the jewelry from a corpse or something like that. I was really too young to appreciate the show. And soon after, the characters opened the uncovered coffin, and the camera showed the rotting corpse wearing a white dress. The camera zoomed in on the rotting skull, and my bedroom door slammed shut. And the same scratching sound from earlier grew louder on the pillow, right next to my head. I pulled the blankets over my head, and forced myself to fall asleep to escape the hell I had found myself in. Some time passed with no further activity. I found myself in the hospital. My sister was giving birth to her first son. I started to tell the story to my aunt, who had lived in the house as a child. She explained that these sorts of things were in no way strange. I was perplexed. She described that when she was younger, a woman would often appear behind her at the top of the stairs. She described that my mother had seen the same woman as a child, but as an adult, never admitted it. Actually, whenever I brought it up, my mother only slightly smiled. I believe it was part of her coping process in order to continue living in the house for years to come. Soon after my sister got out of the hospital, I brought up the events to her. She was very calm and described that when she lived in the house, a woman in a white dress would come down from the attic, walk into her room, and stand there, silently staring at her. She described the woman would always have long black hair draped over her face. My sister told me she would often ask the woman what she wanted, 
and after receiving no reply would ask her to go away, which she respectfully did returning to the attic. After this, perhaps it was just the fear of what I had been told. I always swore that I saw the same woman lingering throughout the house, always from the corner of my eye, drifting into my sister's old room. Late in the summer, there was a night when my family, which was now me, my mom, and my soon to be stepdad, were gathered around downstairs in the living room. My mum asked if I could go up and close my sister's old bedroom door, which was located at the end of the short hallway, so that the heat didn't draft into her vacant room, but rather into the two occupied bedrooms. When I approached the dark room, I reached my hand normally towards the knob. But as my hand touched the brass handle, things changed. The door flew shut in my face. Immediately, I thought that someone had broken into our home and was in my sister's room. I tried the knob several times, but the door was locked tight. I ran downstairs and explained what happened and that it was probably wise that we leave the house to call the police. She didn't believe me at first and asked, laughing, that we go upstairs and inspect the door. So I grabbed my little league bat and three of us went to check on the door. Each of us pulled on the knob and were unsuccessful. We heard movement from the room and my mum and I went outside to wait in the car with the police on speed dial as my stepdad attempted to get into the room. Eventually, when nothing terrible happened, we went back inside and approached the door once more. My mum, not believing in the ghost stories that had swirled through her home for generations, simply said, All right, that's enough. Just open the door. As she reached for the knob, the door swung open before her hand could touch it. I went inside, checking under the bed, behind the door, and in the closet, but found nothing. My grandfather used to come and visit us quite often before he passed. It was quite easy since he lived in the house he had built next door, once he had given our house to my mother. He described to me a story that, although I couldn't tell if it was just messing with me or not, he pointed to the large oak tree in the center of our backyard and said that a long time ago, a man and a woman lived in the house. The husband had gone insane and killed his wife in the house before going to an oak tree that stood right beside the one in our yard and hung himself. He continued to say that they cut down the oak tree where the deed had been committed and they left the untainted one standing. What happened next, however, was too real. He took me for a walk behind his house into the woods. A few hundred yards in was a seemingly ancient cemetery. He described that in the cemetery was where the woman was buried, while the man was cremated. In all honesty, I really didn't think about this story too much. A lot of time passed with no significant events taking place. I had only told my best friend Dan of these experiences. And one night, I planned to stay over to his house. We were much older at this point, juniors in high school, I believe considering that we were driving, still having an innate fear of the home I lived in, especially being there alone. I asked him to come with me to grab some clothes for the night. He came inside and followed me to the basement where my freshly dried shirts were and started yelling, come out spirits, come on, come out. I explained to him, Dan, the basement looks creepy, but everything bad in the house is upstairs. Please just stop. You get to leave here and not come back. I have to sleep here. He seemed to understand and didn't say anything more as we climbed the stairs, where all of my books and notebooks for the school year were presently stacked. However, when we went into my bedroom, he tried once more to get a glimpse in what I had been describing. As I knelt down to my lowest drawer to get a pair of socks, he began to taunt. As he stopped yelling, we heard a large crash down the stairs. I told you, I said. When we peered down, we saw that all of the books had been thrown across the room. We didn't say anything to each other. We didn't try to clean up the mess. We just left. Years later, 
as I write this. The house has been seized by the bank in an equally complicated series of events. I live about 20 minutes from the old house as it sits rotting. Sometimes I drive there and just sit in the driveway, staring into the upstairs window of my sister's old bedroom, wondering if there's a woman with dark hair staring back. Never once in my life did I go into the attic. The closest I ever came was when one day my sister and her now two boys were visiting. Her younger son and I were upstairs playing with trucks when suddenly he ran into the bathroom. The bathroom was where the steps to the attic were, which my mum had blocked off with several layers of plastic for whatever reason. I was terrified. He had run forwards, what I considered to be into the lion's den. I approached the doorway that went to the stairs, which went to the attic. I peeked in and could barely make out the child in the darkness. He was at the top of the stairs looking at the plastic, taking in his newly forming broken English to someone, something that had called him to the stairway that he didn't know existed. In a rush of courage, I sprinted up the stairs, scooped him up and shut the door behind me for the last time before we moved out. When I was around 16, I was coming home from the south of France to London via coach. It was an overnight trip, and I've always struggled to sleep when traveling. So sometime in the middle of the night, I'm sat there awake while the passengers slept. I was sitting towards the back of the bus, just behind the stairs to the toilet, but on the opposite side. I happened to glance over towards the stairs and saw two figures looking out of the window. The thing is, and I know this sounds crazy, they were level with the floor of the bus. But where they stood, they should have been about three feet lower with the level of the bus. The figures were what I can only describe as ghostly, and although I didn't see their face, I felt like they were female. I also got a sense that they were sad, and maybe from a period of time of the past. I can't explain how or why I could feel this, and over the years I've tried to rationalize what I saw. I know for sure I didn't fall asleep, but I can't explain it. I'm not saying I believe in ghosts or an afterlife or anything like that. I do wonder though whether perhaps someone died on that stretch of road. Of course, no one believes me, but I know what I saw, and it was pretty creepy. This happened to me a number of years back. I was home alone, and my boyfriend had gone to work. He works the night shift, and I usually work on weekends as I'm studying. I was just chilling, playing some games, and talking to some friends, while generally just enjoying my free time. My boyfriend can't message me from his job, so I'm just trying to make the most of my time before I go to bed. It must be around midnight at this point. And I look at my phone and decide, given the time, that I might as well call it a night. I start unplugging my consoles, which is a ritualistic thing for me to do, as I have this fear that they might catch fire in the night. So after unplugging everything and getting ready to hit the hay, I start putting on my nighty when I hear something in the distance. At this point, it's important to note that we live in a block of apartments, but this block of apartments is on the outskirts of town, and there's only one entrance with a whole lot of woods surrounding us. I was listening intently as we were on the ground floor of these apartments, and I looked out the window without turning the light on. There from the underbrush, I could see a guy followed by another guy and another. Within about 15 seconds, six men, all fairly tall and strong, dressed in black, most of them with masks of some sort covering their head. The traditional hat ski mask thing. I start to grow anxious. What were these guys doing? Surely there wasn't a 
who looks like a thief more contest going on in the middle of the night that I hadn't heard about. They start looking around the building. And seeing as I occupy one corner or about a quarter of the downstairs space, after they go round a corner, I could no longer see them. But I pressed my ear up against the window as they were no longer in view to try and hear them. They weren't exactly being quiet. They were making plenty of noise and trying to fiddle with the front door of the building. Now at this point, I'm starting to get nervous. Are they going to break into someone's flat? I really hope it isn't me. I listen. And that's when I hear an all too familiar click. However, the reason is because moments before, there was someone coming down the stairs. The person going down the stairs obviously ignored these would be intruders, went right past them and carried on. There was no conversation, no noise that would indicate any altercation. And then the door didn't close for several seconds. Looking through my people now, I'm sure they weren't residents here. Not that I could recognize them with masks on. Why would they wait for someone to open the door, which they were fiddling with beforehand? However, I'm trying to not let it get to me and not assume the worst in people. When I look through the peephole, again, I see them looking around the four possible doors that they could try and tackle. It's either that or the flight of stairs. The entrance to my apartment in particular is just behind the stairs. I see them looking, individually looking at each door, trying to make a decision as to which one they're going to go for. And that's when two of them make little hand gestures and point to my door. It's important to note, the reason I can see this is because there's an automatic light sensor, which triggers whenever someone comes in the proximity of the lobby. So I could see them perfectly, but they could not see me through the peephole. They start pointing to my door, and I feel my underwear fill with fear. I knew that they were going to target my home. At that moment, I really truly wondered if police could get here in time. I felt so stupid. Why hadn't I called them before? I try as quickly as I can to walk towards the kitchen where I grab the landline phone and start dialing 999. When the operator gets on the line, I tell her immediately what's going down and that there are six strange men in my apartment complex eyeing up which house to rob, and they are just about to open and break down my door. She's being not very helpful, asking if I'd witnessed a crime being committed because currently they hadn't done anything. And I told her that they clearly didn't live here and were trying to break into the apartment complex. At this point, she says that she's going to send someone out immediately. And after saying if I wanted to stay on the line or not, I tell her I'm going to leave the phone on the counter, but that I need to see what they're going to do. And that if I don't come back in five minutes to tell them to hurry. And if she hears noises, well, that's self explanatory. I go back to the peephole. And there they are. By this point, four of them are looking at one other door and two of them are looking at the door next to mine. I really am starting to grow nervous, but hopeful that the police would be here in time to catch these goons. That's when all of them start merging and conglomerating towards my area. One of them gets a backpack out and starts getting this thing out of his bag. I'm not even sure what it was. It must have been a lockpick. He shoves it in my door and starts jiggling with the lock. I'm standing there in horror. But to my relief, I notice that the chain is over the door. I feel so grateful for my paranoia now. And I know that they're very unlikely to get in. That's when I hear it. They've managed to undo the first lock. I stand there and go over to the kitchen to whisper to the telephone operator what's going on. She says the police are nearly there. And before they can do the second click, do I hear police cars pull up in front of our house. 
the gig is up. They run to the front door as quickly as they can, and I try desperately not to touch my door, because that way I can prove to the police what they've done. The police are more focused on trying to catch the guys. Three of them escape into the dark, but three of them are apprehended. They get taken into the police car, and then a police knocks on the door. I ask him if he wants to take pictures of what they've done already, and he says that they've already done that, and asks to be let in. I'd explain to him what I'd heard and what I saw, and he says thank you for calling and asks if anything else had happened to my memory. I tell him no. I was so afraid. I was so close to being robbed. I can't believe it. I never thought anything like this would happen to me. Moral of the story is, well, it's better to be safe than sorry. It's better to lock your doors and be paranoid than not. I have friends who live in somewhat safer areas who say they never lock their doors at night, and I don't think I'll ever understand that. The remaining three guys were eventually caught, as their three friends ratted them out. I don't know what happened to the case. I was never kept up with the case, but I hope that these guys were charged. In any case, let's not meet again. I take the bus a lot, and we've met all manner of people, from loud and obnoxious to quiet and lewd and cruel and polite and sweet. I'm disabled and have a service dog who is honestly the sweetest thing to ever walk on four paws. She's a Labrador mix called Raven. Now my service dog Raven completely ignores most people and barely acknowledges the existence of the rest. And that's good. That's honestly very good. But today, for some reason, she made a sound out of her face that I've never heard from her before. It sounded like a woo woo woo. It wasn't a bark, as her bark is very pronounced, and it wasn't a howl. There was this exceedingly creepy dude that was muttering to himself that came over to stand with us at the bus stop to wait for the bus. He was just mumbling, no earbuds, no headphones, no anything. He sat in the cold snow right next to where Raven had just urinated, and he sat beside it. He walked in circles, kicked over a few cans, all the while mumbling quietly to himself. Throughout all of that nonsense, Raven ignored him, right up until he started to approach me on my deaf side. And then she turned on her head towards him and made this little woo 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 noise, not loud or vicious, or anything like a normal dog would do. She stood there by my side, turned her head to look at him, and continued making that noise. And when I looked back at him, he backpedaled. Now she did this every time he tried to approach me. And right up until the bus came, and she stopped, and we got on. And then the creepy dude got on too. But she didn't make it again once we'd got on the bus. Thankfully, I haven't seen him since. But quite honestly, I wouldn't want to meet him again. I have been fortunate enough in my brief time on this earth to have had many paranormal experiences. I recently noticed activity has spiked at my house as well as my girlfriend's, but the activity at my girlfriend's is much creepier, unfortunately for her. My girlfriend has talked about how she always has these uneasy feelings whenever she's home alone, and about the experiences her older siblings have had and such, like knocking and scratching. Her siblings have long since moved out, and both her parents work and travel, so a lot of the time it's just me and her at the house. At the house, they have a walk-in attic. Basically, it's on the same level as the rest of the second floor, and both upstairs rooms share a wall with it. But the activity doesn't stop there. I first felt something was off, one of the first times I was staying over. No one was at the house except me and her, and we decided to call it a night. She went upstairs before me, and I went into the kitchen for water. I then proceeded to the staircase and felt the sudden urge to sprint upstairs as fast as I could. All throughout the night, we could hear what sounded like heavy furniture being shuffled around downstairs. 
My girlfriend was understandably in denial, and we eventually fell asleep. We awoke at 9am the next day, to what was the unmistakable sound of someone running up the stairs. At the time, her bed was against the wall that is shared with the stairs. I actually fell out of the bed from being startled, and we were the only ones at the house that weekend. Let's fast forward to the present. I'm in the house as I'm writing this. The bed shares a wall with the previously mentioned attic. On and off for about an hour, we've been hearing tapping and scratching on the wall behind us. I've already gone into the attic twice with all the lights on and an LED flashlight. I'm no expert, but I couldn't find any evidence of rodents or other pests. Maybe it's something in the wall. I'm a logical person and always try to debunk strange things before confirming them. However, given what we've already experienced, I'm not so sure. We'll just have to wait and see, I suppose. A number of years ago, I was taking an overnight bus between two states. I had a job interview in the morning and was going to get to my hotel relatively early in order for me to freshen up and go. I was very nervous and couldn't sleep. Everyone had their little curtain closed, and it was just me with my little reading light trying to go through my notes and memorize what I was going to say. I was sweating bullets. I'm generally a nervous person and don't like being in these situations, but career progression meant a lot to me, and I knew I needed to embrace this in order to get a better paid job. I looked out the window for some time, contemplating my fate, which is when I saw it. I saw a blur run past the bus, faster than the bus. I rubbed my eyes a little. Surely there was nothing going faster than this bus. I mean, the Greyhound wasn't by any means the fastest vehicle on the road. But how could something overtake us? I rubbed my eyes again. I knew I was imagining it. And just as I looked down at my paper, my window curtain was open, and I just glance out for a minute. When we zoom past, a wolf-like creature standing up on both legs, standing on the side of the road. I tilt my head as we pass it, and I see it for an instant standing there with this huge toothy grin. It took a couple of seconds to register what I had seen. And by the time I realized I had seen something paranormal, did I look back again and it was gone. Far too far in the distance for me to see it. Was I crazy? Or was I seeing something unexplainable? I was kind of young at the time, perhaps seven or eight but old enough to know what was going on. I lived in a pretty decent neighborhood, but my family was in the process of moving. There was a large mixture of families with children and retired seniors living on my street. There was a neighborhood babysitter who took care of my younger sister when she was too young to go to school. She also happened to babysit me on multiple occasions. She was always kind of rude. A pudgy lady with two annoying sons and a very weird husband. A lot of kids got taken care of by her, so my parents trusted her to take care of us. Everything was somewhat normal, except for the fact that she was kind of rude to anybody that wasn't her kid. Her kids were pretty misbehaved. They were always fighting, hitting each other with plastic swords, and screaming at the top of their lungs. At one point, the youngest of toddlers had a nap, and she forced all of the children to sit in a corner and be quiet besides her kids. Odd behavior for a babysitter, but we never thought much of it. Another thing to mention is that she took naps while babysitting, as in she didn't pay attention to the kids. She just shooed them away and fell asleep. She was also notorious for giving her sons chocolate milk, and telling others they had to have water. My sister and I tried to ignore it, but eventually we were kind of annoyed. My sister had a loud mouth, 
So she told my mum about how she treats the kids she looks after versus her own children. I'd also like to acknowledge that my sister had just turned four, so she wasn't great with words. My mum was angry with the babysitter, but let it slide as we were moving in a month and she didn't know if we were being completely honest. The house we moved to is the house I spent a large majority of my childhood and teenage years in. Things were normal once we transitioned into the new house, until we got the calls. We changed our phone numbers, so we weren't really sure how the babysitter and her husband had found it so quickly. She called every day, saying that we needed to pay her and that we owed her money. She was just angry that we moved, and were currently on the lookout for a babysitter that was closer to home. My parents received these calls every day, and they consisted of the babysitter and or her husband screaming, which meant that I could hear the voicemails and calls quite clearly. They kept harassing us, and my parents grew agitated and worried. It all ended one night at 10pm, when my sister woke up to the sound of banging on the front door. It continued for a good 10 minutes, and it was very loud. My sister was freaked out, so I decided to go see if my parents were awake. They were. They'd opened their eyes, kind of confused to see what was going on. My dad told my mum to stay upstairs, and he foolishly went downstairs to get the door. As I stood at the railing nervously, my sister stayed in the bedroom, because she was unaware as to what was actually happening. When he opened the door, I felt sick and terrified. There was my babysitter and her husband, who managed to not only find our address, but also our phone number. The husband started screaming at the top of his lungs, yelling how he owed him money and to pay them, and shaking a knife. Yes, he had a knife in his hand. My dad told him that we didn't, and he warned him to leave unless he wanted the cops to be contacted. He didn't care. My dad went to close the door, but he stuck his foot in it, attempting to get inside. My babysitter was also yelling, but I couldn't hear what she had to say. We had a phone upstairs, so my mother quietly called the cops, as my dad struggled to get the door closed. Once he did, the banging and screaming continued. They wouldn't leave our property. I was freaked out, so I started crying. My sister saw me crying and she did the same. Long story short, about an hour later they left, and the cops arrived having just missed them. My parents knew their info based on the fact that they babysat us, so it wasn't hard to track them down, and they were arrested. I always wondered if their children were home alone or left to sleep over, especially at a time so late. Regardless, they were released a few days later, but were not allowed to step foot near our house. I'm not sure if that woman still babysits, but if she does, I feel terrible for those kids. We never really knew what their intentions were that night. My dad saw the knife and knew they were up to no good. All I can say is psychotic babysitter and your husband. Let's not meet again. To give you guys some background info, I started a job as this lady's personal assistant for half the day, and then her kid's nanny for the other half. She bought this house near Seattle that was built in the 1960s, and has only had one previous owner. The guy died, but apparently not in the house. I started my job in April, and after a week or two, I was watching her six-year-old and the doorbell rang. Now, from where we were sitting, I have a full view of the front, and no one was there. The kid goes, Oh, that happens sometimes. The doorbell rings, but there's no one there. I brush it off as a wiring issue, since she's had the house remodeled. So life continues, and the doorbell rings here and there a few times a week. But then one day, as I'm making the kid a snack, he tells me, the front door just cracked open. So I check it out, 
and it was a bit cracked and I brushed it off. Not having closed the door all the way when we got home, I guess. So I went to go and shut it all the way. When a minute later, the door cracks open again. I freak out at this point and went to shut it once more and made sure it was slammed shut. A few minutes later, we heard it crack open again. So I just lock it. And an hour later, the doorbell rang and I was ready to get the hell out of that house. Last week, I was upstairs putting away laundry. And as I was coming down the stairs, I freaked since the door was cracked. And literally, as I shut the door and locked it, the doorbell rings. I've never been so freaked out in my life before. Then yesterday, Oh, yesterday, the kid and I are sitting there when the doorbell rings. But this time it was totally different. The doorbell tone was not similar whatsoever to their current one. The kid goes, that's not our door ring. And I say, I know. I go outside and start messing with the doorbell to see if in any way possible, the doorbell could make that sound but there's no way it could. I swear the owner who lived there before's doorbell rang and it was some freaky glitch in the matrix stuff. After that, I said, if there's someone here, you are not welcome. Please leave us and the family who live here alone. This morning I was leaving with the kid and as I was getting ready to shut the door, I stopped because I heard faint whispering around the upstairs and then something from the shelf fell into the kitchen. And I never left so damn fast. So what's going on? If someone is here, why do they keep ringing the doorbell? And how the hell do they make it ring a different tone? Freaky. One morning while I was alone in the house, all of the fire alarms started going off at once. It didn't make sense and I checked the entire house for a fire. I wasn't cooking. It was 50 degrees out, so it wasn't hot. And when I brought it up to the lady I worked for, she told me that it was weird that all of the fire alarms were going off at once when none of them were all wired together. It only happened once, but it seriously didn't make sense. The lady I work for knows that weird stuff is going on. And the kids and her call it Harold the ghost. But she knows things were slowly starting to progress too. I came back to the house with her early one day. And she was saging the entire house and said, I think it's time we say goodbye to Harold. But two weeks ago, I had to watch the kid at the house a whole day since he had a day off from school. And while we were downstairs, I saw something moving from the corner of my eye and I have a full view of the upstairs and his door. It was freaking me out because it was opening and closing on its own, but it never completely shut or anything. There was no air moving. And of course, it seemed as if the house was haunting and this spirit, or whatever it was, was doing different things now. The temperature in the house began to randomly drop drastically in areas that we were in, and then go back to normal. Like it gets so damn cold out of nowhere, and then goes back to feeling semi warm. Today, this afternoon, I told the kids to go and shower. And we're walking upstairs. He trips going up the first step. Now to the right of us is the extra nice living room that no one goes into. But my boss had it all decorated for Halloween. She has this giant white ghost thing that hangs from her giant front window that you can also see from the outside. Now this ghost decor has a button that when you push it, automatically makes a demonic sound that says follow me. It isn't sensor based at all. It doesn't do weird stuff when you pass by. So you literally needed to give it a solid push to the button 
for it to do anything at all. It's not plugged in or anything. Anyway, he's crying, and the ghost decor is not anywhere near us. But we have sight of it, and it goes off. It plays the flipping sound like someone pushed the button, but no one did. The kid stops crying, and is freaked out himself, and he has never been freaked out by the thought of a ghost. It's been up since October first. And has never done that, but tonight it did. I never wanted to cry so badly, and I still had thirty minutes until my boss came home. The kid tells me, "You know, that was really freaky, but the ghost did some other things when you weren't here." He said, "You know how Mummy took all of the smoke alarms, because the alarms kept going off randomly, but one time, when you weren't here." And we were all sleeping. The alarms went off again, but Mummy took out the batteries before that happened, so it didn't make sense. Funny thing is, I've seen the fire alarms laying out, and thought she was just replacing the batteries or something, and never put them back. But I now realise the actual reason. She saged the house and said prayers, and even poured salt all over the ground. And the front, but it seems like whoever it was hasn't left, and still likes to come out, but is showing himself in different ways now, and is obviously progressing. People were saying before that the doorbell probably has wiring issues, but apparently, the old doorbell rings that sometimes rings, is an entirely different wire in a different area, that still goes off. And now all of this new weird stuff. What else is there to do, when warding off unwanted spirits? So I'm a nanny, and this is a girl I watch for about twenty hours a week, and she talks about India at least once. This started a couple of months ago, when she named her blanket Perla. She came up with that name. And her other blankets are Mr. Blanket and Rhoda. Let me tell you a bit about this girl. She'll be four in March, and we'll call her Macy. She's afraid of going to the bathroom in the toilet, and she's afraid of jumping, and she hates trying new things and change. She is an extremely intelligent girl. At two, she would sit and do a thirty-piece puzzle all by herself for hours at a time. Now her favourite thing to do is play with Barbies, and she has a very wild imagination. The only downside to this child is her being so fragile with her stubbornness. She's so so smart though. I've never met another smarter three-year-old. I've read that sometimes kids' fears could be explained by something in their past lives. Anyway, she started talking about how she actually lives in India. And though she didn't actually live where she did, as she knows her street, city, country, and state, until recently, it's been, I actually live in India, and she talk about her life in India and her sisters, usually short names starting with the letter P. Sometimes she'll give somewhat detailed stories about India and her sisters and her wedding. She consistently has told me that she never wanted to get married ever. And gets very upset if I ask her why. Maybe because she had an arranged marriage in India. Today, though, she gave me a creepier story. In India, I was a chef, and when I got old, people were taking care of me. I would talk, then I hiccuped, and then I couldn't walk any more. Then it got really cold, and I was freezing, and I still couldn't talk. Then there was a wizard who put a stuck spell on me. And when he took it off, I was born into a baby and couldn't talk, but I could in my head, and now I'm big, and I can talk. I just want to know if this has happened to anyone else, or if their children have said anything. I'm not her mother, so I can't take her to a hypnotist or anything to delve deeper. But I'm interested in knowing what I can do to get more of the story out, as it's very, very chilling. Years ago, when I was about thirteen, 
I made a post on Craigslist advertising babysitting services as a way to make some extra money. The morning after I made this post, I got a phone call to no number from a man supposedly interested in hiring. As soon as I heard his voice, I got an anxious feeling. He was whispering and talking very low and kind of slow the entire time. It was extremely off putting and sounded like he was middle aged. So we exchanged hellos and he was saying what he's calling about and asks what I'm charging and asks my name, which he would repeat over and over throughout the conversation. Just to add to the strangeness, age and other details. So anyway, he says he has a young son for whom he needs a babysitter. Then he begins asking me about my experience. And then strangely, diving into overly lengthy descriptions of his own life. I don't remember the details of the conversation. But I do remember one thing he asked extremely clearly. Now, Soren, my son sometimes he likes to touch himself. That wouldn't bother you. Would it? In his creepy, slow, low voice. I just remember being filled with anxiety and wanting to hang up immediately. It was just sort of beyond TMI. His voice and tone really made it a lot worse. He sounded serious, but at this point, I was partly convinced that this was some sort of prank and was almost certain he didn't have a kid. I had no idea how to respond. And even though this was on the phone and me being stupid, and at this point a petrified 13 year old, I responded with no. And I'm sure he realized how nervous I sounded because he just kind of gave a low chuckle and continued because you know how little boys are. Honestly, a lot of details of that convo were blurred and it went by fairly quickly. I just remember kind of nodding and yesing my way through to the end. And he asked my availability and I said I would call him back. He ended with, okay, thanks and a little chuckle and hung up. I can't remember whether he gave me his info or not, but I'm pretty sure he didn't call me back. I do remember jumping on my computer and taking my ad down as soon as that convo ended. I felt like complete crap after that phone call and wondered whether or not this was a normal discussion for an adult to try and have with a potential child babysitter. I mean, it's not, isn't it? For a little background, I'm a 20 year old female from Germany. When I was 17, I was in a long distance relationship and was desperate for some extra cash because I spent most of my pocket money on train tickets to see my boyfriend. I had put up a babysitting ad on the German equivalent of Craigslist. I soon got a call, not an hour after putting up the ad. I was greeted by the voice of a man. The conversation started off innocently enough with him telling me he had an eight year old that needed someone to watch him after school as both him and his wife were working full time. I told him sure, and that I could do that. I expected him to ask me about my experience with kids or something. But instead, he went on to tell me that his son could be a little difficult. I told him, I don't mind. And I can find a way to deal with that. Would you hit him if he's being naughty? I was taken very aback by this question. I am very against violence against children. Even spanking is child abuse in my eyes. I told the man that I would do my best to find a non violent way to deal with the problems. But what if he's hitting you? Would you hit him back? I replied with a firm no. At this point, I was starting to feel angry. As it dawned on me at this point, it was a common occurrence that this child would be hit. He kept on throwing scenarios at me and asked if I would discipline his son in that situation and that his old babysitters apparently frequently spanked him. I eventually told him as politely as I could that if a parent chose to use spanking as a form of punishment, that was their business. But as a babysitter, I had no right to hit a child. He was silent for a while. 
Then he asked me if I would bathe his son. I honestly don't remember my exact response, but it definitely wasn't yes. He went on explaining that his son was supposed to take a bath every Thursday, and that he hated taking baths. He wanted to know how I would make him getting the bathtub, and if I would strip him naked. At this point, all the red flags came up. I dodged the questions as best I could, and said something to the effect of, things like this are a parent's job, not a babysitter's, and that the parents should make him take a bath in the evening or after work. But he kept pressing, asking things such as, if I'd wrestle his naked son into the bath, or spank his butt if he refused. I kept saying no until he eventually said he called me back. I removed my phone number from the ad immediately, and told people to contact me via email instead. I also got a new phone number, for reasons unrelated to this unsettling call a few weeks after. So I luckily never heard from him again. I just hope his son, should he actually have one, which I honestly kind of doubt, is okay. I'm just a babysitter. Nothing glamorous. I've had some pretty bad kids that not even Trump could pay me to watch again. The most recent is the rich brat from down the street from me. He got banned from an online server for a game for being racist. He then started smashing flat screens like nothing, threw his two controllers made of gold down a flight of stairs and burnt two lovely but expensive cushions. I only made $20 that day, because the one raising him had to come home early, and was fired the next week for not being able to control him. I wasn't paid enough anyway, as this kid was a major breaching contract in almost every way. My rules state the child cannot have any issues of any kind that require medication. All children must be toilet trained, and no autism or anything like that, because I can't deal with it. I can hardly tolerate my own autism. This kid was very sick, back and forth to the ER his whole life. So he had meds galore, despite being 11, and he refused to use the toilet. So I constantly had to run up and down the stairs with empty jugs of pee. I would of course quit on the spot if he tried me with crap. And, if he's not autistic, he's the next serial killer. This boy has problems. I've met loads of folks on the spectrum. Some were nightmares. They had to lock in padded rooms in schools, and some were like me, being able to fake being normal in order to get an education. This kid was down the middle, and rich enough to buy off folks who would have reported his behaviour. The one thing before that drove me to drinking. It was around Christmas, and my mum forced me to take a job watching her boss's kids, who were, again, almost all my rules. Mum really needs me to do the job, so I did it for her. I'd been warned that the daughter was bossy, and I thought, how bad can it be? So here's the story. A few years ago, right before the holidays, my mother's boss needs a sitter. No big deal, I've been babysitting since I was 7 for my family, and others since 13. So I agree. She is a family friend, and former sitter of mine and my siblings, so it'd be only fair, right? My rules have never changed. No kids under 4, no special needs, handicap slash autism, and I don't do diapers. Pretty much no babies, or hard to handle kids. I know I couldn't handle it with my anxiety, temper, and own my autism. I hope everyone else understood that. Well, I get there. And the oldest, a little girl called Jan, of age six, greets me. She looks like someone brought a Christmas porcelain doll to life, and was so beautiful. Her brother Ty was next. Guess what? He's two still in diapers and had speech issues. I hid my anger until the mum left, and then texted my mum, telling her the son was a breach of contract, and that I was legally allowed to walk out. My mum told me that she needed that job, so I had to stay. 
Only for my mother will I ever tolerate kids in general. So the day goes on and nothing happens. I'd been warned that Jam was bossy and hard to control, but so far so good. And Ty was the perfect angelic baby. He took naps, no issue, ate all his food, wiped his mouth. Too bad I had to change his butt, otherwise I'd have been in love. The next day I go back, and holy sweet mother of Jesus did I wish I hadn't. Ty was never an issue at any point ever, unless Jan did something to get him going. It was at that point I learned that all the previous sitters had been fired because they dared to tell Jan no, or try to add some order to her life, which she needed as nobody was ever home, and her day consisted of being bounced from playgroup to daycare to friends and home, with a new sitter every other day. I won't bore you with any more details, so here's the quick version. Jen decides she wants to do painting, but Mom only left one small bit of paper for each kid, so I sacrificed my sketchbook after I removed my work. Jan decides she's the next Michelangelo, and in the time it takes me to blink, she's got fluorescent purple paint up the walls and all over the hardwood floors and leather sofa. While I'm clearing it up, as I was not permitted to ask the kids to help, though Ty did as his daycare taught him manners, Jen decides to get the glitter and set out a large jar of dime-sized colour styrofoam balls and dumps them all over the wet paint and covered floor. At that point, my anger bar was maxed out, and I honestly wanted to lock her in the turkey coop. Yes, they had pet gobblers. But I kept my cool and decided to give the kids their snacks, and let the bubble guppies occupy themselves. I now have 95% of the mess cleaned up, and I'm feeling proud. Ty starts crying and tugging his pants, Translation, I pooped. So I put on my mask, whipped out the dirty diaper off, and voila, clean kid. It's then his nap time, so I brought him into his room, tucked him in, and that was that. I return to the living room and Jan is gone. Where is she? Her room? What's she doing? Dumping four of those mega Lego tubs on the floor. I took a moment to compose myself and then simply told her that she was to keep the Legos in her room. Jan throws a tantrum that not even the kids on Super Nanny could top and kicks all her Legos all over and stomps off into the rec room down the hall, leaving me to clean up about 3,000 Lego pieces. Thankfully, the Legos are cleaned really quickly thanks to a big broom. Think the ones janitors have with a bucket-like dustpan attached. I notice Jan being quiet and zip into the rec room, letting Ty out of his room. Jan has somehow broken into the closet containing her father's tools. Thankfully, she's only managed to get the tools out and not use them. I ask her to hand them over, and she tantrums again and throws a container of screws onto the floor and breaks it. It's the Lego thing all over again. It's finally supper time. Mum has left veggies and cold cut meats, leftovers from the food place she runs, and I pop that into the microwave. I cut ties extra small as per the mother's orders and start cleaning up more to try and keep on top of Hurricane Jan. Ty decides he wants more veggies, and as I was scooping them, Jen steals the knife I was using and begins stabbing the TV because the wind has knocked out the signal. I managed to get it off her quite easily, as I had recorded a few episodes of Guppies in advance and played them. After eating, Jan decides she would like a bath. What I don't know until it's much too late is that their tub doesn't get cold water. So I'm running to and from the kitchen with jugs of cold water, and then I hear a splash. Jan has pulled a wall-mounted rack of shampoo, conditioner, and anything else you can imagine, and is now dumping it all over her head and tie, who is now naked in the tub as well. Jan decides the water's still too hot and gets out, gets a huge glass jug, fills it, and then immediately drops it. And now there's a mini flood of broken glass everywhere. 
At least the paint's getting washed off more. I tell the kids to stay in the bathroom as I clean it. By now I'm having chest pains at the ripe old age of 19. Jen hands her brother a steak knife and tells him to run with it. I quickly dump a pack of plastic spoons, Ty's obsession on the floor, and he dropped it and I locked the knife away. Jen decides to somehow pick the lock on her mother's door and go through my bag and throws a fit because I wouldn't let her have one of my candies. They were medication. And while the sleepy effect would have made this whole situation better, I am against drugging children or harming them and tried explaining that they were medicine, but she kept on screaming. Jan rips out one of the rooters from the walls and wrecks the room in the kitchen. I go numb and have the mother of all panic attacks in the middle of the cleanup. Her mother comes home and I bolt from the house to my mum, who is outside having a smoke. She has to hold me because I'm about to faint. I was not allowed to tell the mother what her hell-spawn daughter did, as her mother is the my baby is perfect in every way type. I went home, drank a pint of whatever booze I found, and locked myself in my room for the next week. I got paid next to nothing, because I clearly could not take care of the children. I still have panic attacks when I see this kid almost five years later, and despite warnings, my girlfriend was recently hired to watch them. She lasted all of six hours before she quit. There's still purple paint on her glasses and purse. This happened about two days ago, while my brother and his wife were at a party. My own wife and I often get called in to babysit my nephews and nieces for these sorts of moments by all my siblings. In this instance, we were asked to babysit my five-year-old nephew, his three-year-old sister, and his six-month-old brother, and we happily obliged. They live in a new house, and the only significant location near it is an important cultural site for the local Cree people, about 10 kilometers away. The hard work was done for us, as the five and three-year-old were asleep upstairs before we arrived. The baby was not fussy, but would not sleep. So we were hanging out with him on the main floor. As the night dragged on, around 10.30, I heard a baby crying upstairs. Thinking the, thinking the three-year-old must have woken, I left the happy baby with my wife and went to check on our niece. My wife heard the crying as well and asked me to go check. On my way up the flights of stairs, I definitely heard crying from that floor. And when I pushed my head into the kids' room to listen, the crying was still going on, but both kids were sound asleep. The sound was coming from the nursery across the hall. So being quite confused, I moved towards that room. The crying ceased about midway between the door and the crib. Seeing as the room was empty, I immediately began to try and explain it to myself. I grabbed the baby monitor unit in the room to make sure it wasn't picking up an errant signal from another house. It wasn't on, and didn't have a speaker anyway. There were no toys that made noise around, and no TVs nor devices that might play those kind of noises in a room. I stuck around to listen for a while longer, but nothing came of it. My wife was baffled and a little spooked, as she had clearly heard the crying as well. Nothing happened the rest of the night, as my nephew is still the wonderful kid he's always been. So I guess, no harm, no foul, spooky ghost. My brother and his wife went white as a ghost when I told them about it at Christmas. But to my knowledge, it's the only thing like that that has ever happened in their house. His house has no history and plenty of crucifixes and the like and has been smudged. So no advice is necessary from anyone. I just thought you might all enjoy a wholesome and unexplained experience. This is something that happened to me as a toddler. My family told me about this a few years ago. I was too young to really remember much, but there are parts of the story I do distinctly remember. I always had a nanny who took care of me. 
My mum's pregnancy took a toll on her, and she became really sick. So she had to get treatment abroad while my first years I was with my dad and nanny. When she came back, the nanny was taking care of me, and she stayed with us for a few years until I was in preschool. She and I were really close, like really close. I can remember her distinctly, and there were even images in our photo book of me and her. My mum says that I would not refer to her, as in my mother, as my mother, and I'd stay away from her to be with my nanny. Also, my mum's illness made her emotionally really weak at that time, so apparently the nanny would tell me to ignore my mum, and she wouldn't let my sister be around me. I also live in a country where labour is cheap, and having stay-in or full-time helpers is quite common. I just remember being attached to her constantly. She kept treating my mum and sister really bad, but they didn't have the heart to fire her because of how attached I was. However, my uncle and his family were in town visiting us, and he got so angry at the way that she treated my mother that he fired her on the spot and made her leave the house. I vividly remember crying my eyes out and running after the nanny to the lift of our apartment. My cousins had to pull me back. It was bad. So the crazy part is that after, my parents found a lemon with pins stuck in it and a phrase written in her native language on this piece of parchment paper in the same room at our house. Anyway, we found out that she'd been going to a shaman or a dark magic priest and casting spells like those so that I would forget who my mom was and think my nanny was my mum, in order to basically steal me away as her own. Before you think I'm lying, and think that this is one of those made-up stories, I live in an Asian country that has a large dark magic culture. It's really covert, but everyone knows it's there. It's scary to think that if my uncle wasn't there, she probably could have taken me away, since she lived at home and slept in my room, and I would have been raised in a completely different way. I feel bad because she probably felt like I was her son, but yeah. This is definitely not the way to go. When I was a kid, my brother and I would get stuck with babysitting the neighbor's kids. His name was Alex. Alex was really fond of my Lego set that I had in the corner of my room, facing the window. He would play for hours, staying preoccupied, while my brother and I would play video games in the living room. So one night when I fell asleep on the couch while babysitting, my brother came to me and asked, Alex is under your bed and shaking. I asked, what's wrong with him? My brother told me to follow him into the room and try to talk him back out from under the bed. I go inside and find him on the verge of tears. He was trembling profusely under my bed. I asked him, Alex, what's wrong? Why are you under there? And he whispered, him, while looking at my sliding closet. As I walked towards the bed in order to help him out, he ran. He ran all the way back over to his house and waited on the front steps until his parents got home. Now, my parents were out to dinner with his, and he explained his whole story in detail to both his parents and mine. His explanation sent shivers down my spine, and when my brother and I left the house to meet up with his parents, and find out what happened. My mum told me that Alex was playing with my Legos and heard a slight murmur from my closet, something that resembled a faint vocalization of come here. He said he looked behind him and noticed that the closet had a slight opening with light peering in from my lamp. He stared at the crack until he saw an eyelid open. He told us that there was a man in my closet. Alex then hid under my bed after he gave out a slight yelp, which attracted my brother's attention. My family rushed back into the house and into my room, and in horror, we find my closet door rocked open and a few things missing. My window had been left open when it was previously closed, and a few things knocked over which had not been touched previously. We still didn't know what force we were reckoning with after the event. Thank God, nothing more severe happened. 
I was babysitting for a family when I was back in high school. The four kids and I were playing in the basement, nicely furnished and not creepy at all. And we heard the front door open and heard footsteps. So we figured their parents were home. All of us ran upstairs to say hi. But when we walked upstairs, the house was empty. Thinking it was just a fluke, we went back to the basement and the oldest girl shuts the door. About five minutes later, we heard the front door open again and we heard footsteps. At this point, all of the children were a little scared. So of course, as the babysitter, I had to be the one to open the door. Screw that. I put my ear end up to the door and was answered with complete silence. We called the parents to inform them of the noise and they said they would be on their way home. Only being a five minute drive away, I was relieved. As we were still playing in the basement, the front door opened again. Footsteps. This time we believed it was their parents. We all ran upstairs, but the house was still empty. As I'm dialing my mum's number, we see the dad run in the front door and check the house. He came into the kitchen and said it was all clear. The children went downstairs as their parents pulled me aside. Then the dad says, we have a worry that it's angry with us and it has been threatening us. But don't worry, there are 14 guns in the house. So if someone does come, have one of the children call the police and you find one of the guns. Then they left us there to continue their dinner. No other noises were heard that night and we stayed in the living room until the parents got home. When I was in eighth grade, I went to a charter school and my sister, who is six and a half years younger than me, went to the same school. It was kindergarten through to eighth. Now, because it was a charter school, it didn't have school buses. So my mother would always drive us to and from. We have schools nearby that use buses. However, one of these was the Country Early College, which would bus people to a community college in the area. This meant that the buses for the early college would travel much further and even occasionally spend time on highways. This is important for the story. We were on our way to school one morning and we were just coming over a hill as we live in the mountains. And I noticed something immediately. The moment I saw what was in front of me, I was already asking my mother, is there a school bus going through that building? She started to tell me no, but then she saw it. The early college bus had gone through the wall of the country store that was across the street from our school. In the parking lot, a parked truck had been crumpled and in the middle of the street, a car had been struck. I'm never going to forget what I saw that morning, and thank God my sister wasn't looking. I can remember so vividly. The accident must have only happened. No emergency vehicles had arrived, and there was a man in the car. I remember seeing him draped across his steering wheel, arms hanging lifelessly out the window, and I remember the blood. Later on, I learned what happened. The man had been drunk driving at 7am and had been swerving. The bus driver had attempted to swerve out of the way, but had struck the car anyway and lost control, hitting the parked pickup and going through the building. Luckily, the worst injury on the bus was a case of whiplash. The man, however, was killed on impact. I also learned that it had been his young daughter's birthday. Honestly, the story doesn't even end there, though that was the worst of it. A year later, I was attending the early college and I was on the bus with several of the students who had been in that first wreck. One morning, we were leaving our base high school to the early college and a car came racing up a narrow road on the wrong side. The driver had two options. He could hit the car or he could swerve and the bus would go through a house. He chose to hit the car. The passenger side crumpled inwards and the front bumper came completely off. But the driver of the car and his girlfriend, who had been in the passenger seat, were all right. 
I think the girlfriend was just bruised up a bit, but that's all. The students on our bus, however, that was another story. I have PTSD from just witnessing the first crash, but many of the others have had to live through it. They had to send all of us home due to the panic that set in. It was horrific. I work in New York City and live in New Jersey. As I was going on my way to take the bus by Port Authority, I saw a bus that was closer than the usual bus I take. The bus driver was outside bringing people into his car. It had the same shape. It was a street away, and it was parked on a different side of the road. I thought it was odd, but I just wanted to get home. As I get in and sit down, I realize this bus is odd. It didn't have the usual stickers or markings or any lights like the usual buses do, and it's tiny. I realize this bus is fake. Just as I realize this, a guy comes running up the bus saying, it's fake, it's fake. That's when I knew my hunch was right, and an older woman and I try to get out. But then the supposed bus driver who's still outside barricades the door. He puts his arms over the door and will not let us leave. So I told him to piss off and pushed him. Both the woman and I ran the hell out of there and onto the real bus. So jackass bus driver, let's never meet again. When I was in first grade, I rode the bus to and from school every day. There was a teenage boy from high school who rode the bus too. One day he asked me to sit with him and told me that he was asked to ride the school bus to help the bus driver keep the children orderly. I remember that he always wore a cowboy hat. Other than that, there were only young grade schoolers who rode the bus. He started asking me to sit with him every morning. He would bring me candy and give me quarters for the snack machine at school. He always told me how pretty I was and how much smarter than the other girls my age I was as well. He would show me his paintings. They were always of beautiful women and mermaids, but they were always topless or nude. I thought that I was very grown up because I got to see his racy art. This went on until Thanksgiving break that year. During Thanksgiving break, I went to visit a friend and had the best time. I remember having my mind blown because her mum had a laminating machine and laminated our drawings so that we could keep them forever. I got back home and thought everything was normal until Thanksgiving day. Over Thanksgiving dinner, my mom angrily mentioned that I had a friend stop by while I was gone to my little girl's friend's house. Somehow, I don't know, I knew that it was the guy in the cowboy hat. The angry way she said it made me confused and ashamed, and I felt so awful that I couldn't finish my Thanksgiving dinner. Years later, I was speaking with my sister, remembering that day, and she told me something I never knew. The day I went to my little friend's house, the guy in the cowboy's hat came to my house in his car. He of course knew where I lived because he saw me get on the bus every morning. He knocked on the door, and my aunt who was babysitting answered. He asked for me by name, and when she asked me what he needed me for, he said he wanted me to take me on a date. My aunt was so angry, she chased him to his car and down the street, hollering that she'd kill him if he ever came back. Come to think of it, I never saw him on the bus again after that Thanksgiving break. So, guy in the cowboy hat that wanted to take a first grader on a date, let's not meet again. This happened about seven or eight years ago, when I was still in high school. Being 16 or 17 years old, 
My friend and I would go to the mall after school on Fridays every once in a while. Neither of us could drive yet, so we would have to take the bus there and back. We would part ways at the transit center and take different buses home. I would be alone on the bus around 9 to 10, and it was pretty dark out by then. I would have a bunch of shopping bags, and my stop was one of the last ones, so there wouldn't be many people on there by the time I got off. Every time I was on my way home, I would always see this man staring at me, and he would give me a creepy smile. So I would try to get up really last minute to see if he would get off, and he would always wait for me to get off before he did. Then he would purposefully walk by me and smile creepily and wave at me, and I would just nervously say hi back and quickly walk or run to my house, since it was only about a minute away. One of the last times I saw him, I was really scared and went to the front of the bus when it was time to get off at my stop. There were two doors to get off the bus, one near the front besides the bus driver and another near the back. I was more shy back then and was scared to speak up. So I kind of just lingered around the bus driver and didn't tell him what was going on. The bus driver just thought that I wasn't getting off so he was about to drive off, but then at the last minute, I told him this was my stop. The bus driver was confused, but let me go, and the creepy man proceeded to get off as well, which means he was lingering around, seeing if I would get off at my usual stop. This time when he walked by me, he had a smirk on his face, and seemed like he knew he was scaring me, and was getting a kick out of frightening me. I never saw him again, and I no longer take that bus. This is from two years ago. I was 16, dressed in a short but fancy dress with makeup on. I'm clearly not a girl, but in fact, transgender. Quite obviously because I was pre-estrogen. I was waiting for a bus at school when I met him. I never got a name or even something I call him. At the time, I was in year 11, and had off periods in the morning, so it was a later bus. The man was talking to people around him the whole time while smoking. He offered me one before I got on. I really hoped he was going in the other direction, but he gets on my bus and sat next to me. He starts talking to a young couple with a newborn baby, I give them a look, and they start to ignore him as I'd been trying to, and they get off at the hospital, and I moved seats to sit where they were. He moved with me, and sat right next to me again. Out of nowhere he blurts out, I just got out of prison for manslaughter and drug dealing. My immediate response was to panic internally. He then offered me marijuana and pills, and declined and said I was a soccer player and they tested me frequently, even though I'm not. I felt an immediate uneasiness when he put his hand on my thigh and rubbed it. I sat there frozen until the bus stopped, and he let go. I ran for my next bus when I noticed he was following me, and got on the same one, and I found myself in the same situation. I noticed for the next few weeks he caught the same bus as me, but kept his distance. He was spotted around my school several times, and even outside my house by my mother. We moved shortly after, and I moved within walking distance of my new school. I still live in constant fear. I wonder if he knows where I live, or if he's still stalking me. This happened back in 2013. During my year in Australia, for reference, I was 19 and a small girl. I had to take a night bus and train from a smaller town back to Sydney. When I boarded the bus, the lights were on, and I saw that there were very few people. A lady with her daughter in the middle, and a middle-aged man, who was Indian, sitting near the back door. 
maybe a few more people in the back. So I took my seat near the very front of the bus. As it was St. Patrick's Day, and I had been day drinking, back in the hostel I dozed off pretty quickly with my head leaning against the window. The lights were turned off, and I was expecting a good two hours sleep until the next train station. Wrong. I woke up. I'm guessing about half hour or an hour later, something had touched the back of my arm. I opened my eyes and was pretty confused at first, but then I understood that there was someone in the seat behind me, stroking my arm through the space between the seat and the window. At first I froze for 30 seconds before standing up and turning around. It was the Indian dude from the back of the bus. I gave him a solid WTF look, as he was still trying to grab my hand from in between the two bus seats, like he was trying to get me to sit down so that he could keep harassing me through my sleep. Yeah, good idea. I grabbed my stuff and just went and sat as close to the bus driver as I could. Unfortunately, he didn't follow me. Must have gotten the hint, I guess. When we get to the train station, it was like a half hour wait and the guy sat across the room from me, and gave me pervy looks the whole time. And I didn't get to sleep off my hangover that night. I'm a sophomore in high school, and I go to a public school, which also means I ride a bus with the same people every day. Now that we have that out the way, let's begin. Last year, I got separated from my two best friends, and I was put onto a new bus route, compared to the amount of people that were on the bus I rode with in 8th grade. This one was practically empty. There were only about 3 high schoolers including me, and around 5 or so middle schoolers. Everything was going great, until I decided to venture to the back of the bus. I was, and still am, a very anxious and antisocial person, so that was a big step for me to take. As the ride continues and everyone gets on the bus, everything is perfect until our last bus stop. Let's call this kid Weasel. Weasel was also in high school. He didn't say much until about a week into school, and he would start asking us questions. They weren't all that weird at first. They started out as questions such as, what's your favourite colour? Or, who do you look up to? Flash forward to the start of summer sports season. Weasel and I didn't get along at all, due to how weird he had become. He had started cracking homophobic and racist jokes, claimed he was a Nazi, wanted to murder all women like Hitler would with the Jews, given all of us vulgar names, and threatened my life and his questions had become more and more personal and offensive. Weasel and I were the only two high schoolers on the bus, leaving me alone with him for about 20 minutes until the middle schoolers were released. He would often twitch violently, say my name over and over, grunt, move seats to get closer to me. Within a week of enduring this, I was scared shitless of him. I ended up sitting up front for the rest of the year until the middle schoolers got on. Fast forward to present day, I found out that his brother had lit a public bathroom on fire and has a history of anger issues would be joining us on the bus. Luckily the bus driver puts middle schoolers up the front of the bus. Weasel only talks about his brother, asks those offensive questions, threatens me and my friends and spews homophobic and racist slurs. On the first day of school, he threw my earbuds out the window, cut out a chunk of my hair and brought a dead raccoon onto the bus. I am terrified that this kid will try to hurt me, and my friends, and I don't know what else to do. So Weasel, let's not meet again. Even though I have to every day, until my best friend gets his license in December. 